this morning. And so everything you need to know, some of you may be familiar with America Learns because you use it in your programs to track your, your learners and tutors. Um, this is a slightly different use of that, but it's a very user-friendly user program. And then Paul is the executive director of Literacy Works. And so he's providing oversight for the whole project. He will be telling you about background checks and payroll and be helping you with all of those things. He's been working with you on your MOUs and site agreements as well. And Bev, do you wanna go ahead and, and introduce your team? I would love to. Um, so the project team that is brought to you by the California State Library is me. I know most of you. I'm Bev Schwartzberg. I'm the Library Programs Consultant who works with California Library Literacy Services at the State Library. And you all know Allison Gifredo, uh, who is the states and literacy, state grants and literacy analyst who works with CLLS. Both Allison and I, um, as well as our colleague Sherilyn Hunt, who is the senior project coordinator for literacy initiatives, which I'll talk about in a minute, we all have backgrounds uh, as library literacy coordinators. So we know where you're coming from. And I certainly participated in the AmeriCorps initiative uh, that went from 2003 to 2010 in California library literacy programs. So I'm super excited to be here. Sherilyn Hunt, uh, who many of you know is the recently retired uh, coordinator from Solano County Library, uh, is working with literacy initiatives, which is a federal grant that supports the work of CLLS. Um, so many of you know or have met Cheryl and along the way. Thanks, Kathy. Thank you. So we have a pretty full agenda here today. We, we do want to make sure that there is plenty of time for questions. Uh, we know that many of you have questions. And so we'll talk about that in the next slide. But um, so we're we're you know a little bit flexible in our schedule today. But we're going to start off talking about it. Well. Uh, because that's why we're here and then and I'll be doing that part of the training and then um, Bev will be talking about the very fun topic of prohibited and unallowable activities and then Lisa will take us uh, through America Learns and many of you might know Susan Vega and so she is coming to spend a little bit of time with us to, um, if there are any really technical questions uh, for us. And so she'll be joining us for a little bit. Lunch, yay! And then um, Paul will be helping us with background checks and taking you through that process, which is very complicated. Some of you have been asking for information about about that in advance of today's webinar. And we really um, preferred to, to talk about this now because it, it's, a, it's a, big, a big thing um, and it needs to be done correctly. So thank you for your patience um, and you'll learn all about it today. And then Paul will also um, talk about e-grants, which is um, another sort of database that, that we'll all be using. And our very lovely and helpful program specialist from California Volunteers AmeriCorps, AmeriCorps um, Iram Jabbar, will be joining us for a little bit during those segments. And then, of course, we are leaving plenty of time for, for questions as well. Um, can somebody admit Aaron, please? All right. Oh, OK. Well. Um, yeah. So we know there will be lots of questions. Please um, put your questions in the chat and we will answer them after each segment. So unless it's just something that is totally burning that you cannot wait to have answered, um, please save your questions for the, the um, end of each of the segments. Um, and then at the end, we will have an open mic, open camera session. We'll not have the slideshow so we can see each other and we'll answer questions that are in the chat box that haven't been answered yet and we'll also um, just have a discussion and answer questions then. So the the big motto for America uh, AmeriCorps California is let's get things done for America. It's all about doing and acting. So we wanted you to see the mission because um, you're going to be supporting an AmeriCorps program and we want you to, to know what AmeriCorps is all about. So it really is about building capacity in communities. So improving lives, strengthening communities and 
encouraging people to really get engaged in their communities um, and through service, through volunteering. So we'll talk a lot about this idea of service. And so it's, it's to be the best that we can be as a country. And so that is what we're gonna be doing. So I, I'm just incredibly proud to, to, to be part of this initiative. Um, and so these are the goals. So it, lots of partnerships here, right? So AmeriCorps doesn't just work in literacy, of course, they, they work in um, health fields, they work in um, poverty, um, uh, poverty initiatives, all kinds, you name it, if there's a human or social service, AmeriCorps has members out there in the community doing good works. And so the second goal uh, for AmeriCorps is to enhance the experience for members and, and we're, we don't have the AmeriCorps senior volunteers, but this is a two-way street, right? So while the, vol the members are helping our programs and our communities, we in return are, are enriching their lives. We're giving them rich life and professional experience. And so please keep that in mind and we'll, we'll have another slide that talks about this too. Goal number three is bringing Americans together in service, right? And so this is all about giving back to your community. Goal four is that we want to make sure that these federal funds that are all our tax dollars are used well, effectively, and that we're good stewards of, of these federal funds. And then goal five is to um, make America a great federal program, right? To make it one of the best, most equitable places to work in the federal government. So that is a very lofty goal. So that's the overview of AmeriCorps. Now we're going to get into some more nitty gritty basics for AmeriCorps. So I said that, that this is an opportunity to enrich AmeriCorps members' lives as well and to provide them really professional development opportunities in all of these different areas. So we want to help them while they're in service to our programs. We also wanna help them transition after that. And we'll talk more about that later. Um, we want them to be sure that they are um, happy in their uh, placements, that they understand their roles and responsibilities, that they understand uh, the full scope of the AmeriCorps program and of your program and of, of the partners. And so that's an important education piece for them that we will cover in the membership training on October 13th. We want them to feel like they're doing something worthwhile. And so we want to give them activities to become involved in that actually help them feel good about their service and, and that they really are connected with other members and with your program and your stakeholders and your community members. So many of you may have heard the expression that AmeriCorps is like the domestic Peace Corps, okay? This is an opportunity. Nobody's in this for the money, that's, that's for sure. And so it really is about doing good acts for American communities. A huge thing that we must all remember and we all must shift our language is that members are not employees. They are not being paid. They are not employed. This is not a job for them. They're engaged in service. So they receive a living allowance and an education award if they are interested in that, but they're not receiving salaries, okay? They're not in a job. And it is a, a full year commitment. You will see in some slides that we are starting in October of 2022, and the initiative ends at the end of September in 2023. So most people will be working about 11, 12 months, um, and some people might complete their hours early. We, we discourage that because we're, you know, it is a year long initiative, but um, the service is until hours are complete or an entire year. 
So this is some of the benefits. I know you've seen some of these sl slides if you participated in the webinars that, that Bev um, facilitated this summer, but we think that it bears repeating. And so there is a living allowance, and we'll talk a, about that a little more in depth in a moment. And so uh, this is indeed a very modest um, semi-weekly, sorry, bi-weekly living allowance. And it really just does cover basic, basic expenses. And then um, there is an education award, which is very attractive to many of uh, the members that will be joining. And so we'll talk much more about that in depth during the um, member orientation. Uh, absolutely wonderful opportunity for them to sharpen their um, professional development skills. And then um, there is a health benefit for full-time members and also an optional childcare benefit for full-time members. And as Bev can tell you, and uh, she certainly demonstrated this in the, the webinars this summer, is that this AmeriCorps experience can lead to amazing job opportunities in the future for members. A lot of the AmeriCorps members who were involved in the CLLS initiative um, 12 years ago have gone on to wonderful jobs in libraries in California, library directors um, and other things. And, uh, and so it's, it's really quite wonderful when you say, oh, wow, you know, we're the, the stepping stone for these AmeriCorps members to go on to, to great things. And lots more uh, benefits that you can see if you go to the AmeriCorps website. So, our particular opportunity is part of the funding is part of the pandemic recovery uh, that the federal government is trying to support. So it's building capacity, especially um, for, um, for services that were lost or compromised during the pandemic. And so I think, please correct me if I'm wrong, Bev, but I, I think what I've been hearing is that during COVID, that many programs lost 60% of their volunteer tutors and 60% of their learners. That is enormous, right? That is a- That's huge. absolutely right, Kathy, you got it. Yeah, and so this I think is just a fantastic opportunity for us to, to rethink what do CLLS services look like? This doesn't have to be devastating. This can be an opportunity, right? This can be a way to reimagine, re-envision your program and your services, and AmeriCorps members can help you do that. So this is just some of the things that AmeriCorps members can do in your program. There are many more, and we certainly, let's talk about those, um, those different activities um, in the discussion parts. But certainly, most of you will probably want to engage your, um, your members in tutoring learners. That could be one-on-one, -on -one, that could be small groups, it could be um, classes, what, whatever you, that could be basic literacy, could be family literacy, could be English as a second language. Um, also, because of so many programs have lost so many learners and volunteer tutors, this is the perfect opportunity to, to, to try to regain some of those numbers that we lost. Um, I'm gonna ask Bev, either now or um, later to, to talk about working on family literacy programs, because I know that there, um, there are some regulations about working with children. Um, is, is this a good time for you to, to talk about that, Bev? I know that there's some- Sure, or you... happily. The intention in working with family literacy programs is that you work with adult learners and the whole family. So sometimes you may be working with children, but your uh, members are not to be child care providers. Uh, I know that's sometimes a demand in family literacy programs, but this is not what members are clear to do, not what members uh, have listed in their service opportunities. It would not be uh, an, an activity um, that they're, they're meant to do. Uh, we want members to work with family literacy programs, but we don't want them to be uh, alone in a room with children. Um, if you have a family literacy program that involves tutoring of children, where there are other adults present, where you're working with the adult and a child, that's totally allowable. Um, but, but supervising children by yourself would not be an allowable activity for members. Thanks, Kathy. Oh, thank you, Beth. 
and participating in outreach events. We've heard from a lot of programs that that's just fallen by the wayside, right? A lot of people are um, uh, just haven't been able to get out and do that. And so this is a, a, a wonderful opportunity to send those members out into your community, to have them get to know your community. Some of your members will be local. They'll know your communities anyway, but some of them will come from outside your location. And so this is a great opportunity for them to get to know um, the, the folks and the, and the partners, your partners, especially in the community. And then promoting learner leadership. CLLS programs, I think more so than any programs across the country, have a strong history of uh, learner leadership that we can be so proud of. And uh, this is another opportunity for, um, for members to, to encourage learner leadership, to build leadership skills. And um, what we hope is that some of you might actually enroll some of your adult learners as members during this opportunity. So what does this look like across the state? So as you've probably heard, they were going to have um, 20 full-time members 30 half-time members and 20 quarter-time members. And so far we have 33 libraries who are participating in the initiative. And Bev, where are we? I think we have some slots available still. Is that the case? Um, we do need to talk with programs and see if you're filling your slots. If you're unable to fill a slot, we could probably transfer that to another program because there are some programs waiting, particularly for full-time and half-time slots. But unfilled right now, or excuse me, unallocated to a library, there are uh, two quarter time slots. So we know things shift around. Um, you're recruiting people. One more person may show up and you might be interested in bringing that person online, or you may struggle to fill a particular slot. So just stay in touch with Kathy and with me. But we are really close to our 70 um, slots being assigned to libraries, which isn't the same as them being filled, of course. Right, right. There, there certainly are screening processes that we'll, we'll talk about. Um, we, um, so the other thing is that if you are having um, any problems filling your slots, please come to us. We'd love to discuss um, recruiting strategies with you, anything that we can do to help. But also if you say, you know, I just don't know that this is going to happen within the time frame that we have, there are some ways that we can work around this. Um, so we would prefer not to. Right now, it, it, um, the requirement is that two members are a minimum for each library jurisdiction. And there's a very good reason for that. We want the members not to feel isolated. We want them to feel like they're part of a cohort. They want the, we want them to have community building opportunities and shared experiences with other members. Um, but if, if you live in a rural um, uh, location or if, you know, there are circumstances, I know some of you are in fire areas, you know, it's a difficult time to be recruiting uh, members when you're struggling with that kind of thing. Please let us know. There may be opportunities to partner with other libraries um, so that you can say, well, we can't make it happen, but we really want this person and we really am going to put this person to, to good use. And so it's like, okay, well then we'll partner you with a nearby library. But again, our strong preference is that there are two members per library. There have also been questions about, can we convert slots? And so we got a question the other day saying, well, okay, I, I, asked for two halftime members, I've only been able to recruit one, can I convert that one, uh, that, can I convert my two halftime slots to one full-time slot? And that really isn't um, possible, and Bev can probably speak uh, more intelligently on this topic. Um, yeah, we, we may be able to change the kind of slots that are offered if there are unfilled slots um, that another library hasn't filled. Or if you have a full-time person who wants to move down to half-time or a half-time dirt um, and you have two half-time people to fill it. So converting down will be a possibility, but because the full-time members earn proportionally such a higher living allowance, um, it is impossible for us to convert um, four quarter-time members or two half-time members to a full-time slot. 
For AmeriCorps, the bottom line is the member service years, which is a lot like FTE for um, California Library Literacy Services programs. Um, so we're looking to have 40 full member service years. And the way we've broken it down is in those 70 slots, 20 full time, 30 half time, and 20 quarter time. But and ask us with questions because when the day you ask that question, maybe the day that somebody calls us and says, I haven't been able to fill a full time slot. So instead of thinking conversion, think about opportunity. Thank you both. That's great. So again, I know that many of you have seen this slide, but we think it is um, a good one to review. And so the minimum hours um, are listed here. If your member wants to invest more time and energy into your program, that's totally fine, but they need to invest at least the numbers that you're seeing on the screen. You can see what Bev was talking about, about the, the disproportionately high uh, living allowance and education award for, um, for the full-time members. They are, they are not um, double, right? Um, and so, um, so that's why the, the conversion process is a little more complicated. Um, and so um, people are still joining, which is so great. Um, and then, um, and $25,000 for a full-time member is a, is, a, is a very decent award, I think. So um, this could be very, very appealing to, to um, some members of your community or outside folks who want to engage in service. Um, the education award, again, that is $10,000 um, is, a, is a, a very nice amount. And during the, um, well, probably on next week's webinar, we can talk more. Um, I know that Bev has gone into more detail um, about, um, you know, how you can use those awards, you can transfer those awards. Um, you know, they're, they're really a very nice um, perk for, for members. And then of course, you probably all know what your local contribution is. And please know that your local contribution, 100% of it will go to the living allowances of your members. So you are investing in your own members with those. And think of all you get for, for $5,000, you get a full-time member, which is quite a good deal. Okay. So now let's get into the member requirements. So, and these are very, very important, right? We, um, members must uh, complete these requirements or they won't, um, or applicants must, or they will not be able to become members. So um, there's an application and interview process and that's, you take care of that. So we have a member position descriptions. We have member service agreements that are official that come from California volunteers AmeriCorps that we need to have um, you sign and the member sign, and then we put them in the member file. But whatever you want to do in terms of recruiting and interviewing and um, adding the members to your program, that's um, at your discretion, okay? We are certainly here to help if you would like us to, but, but you, you do what works best for your program. Okay, now there are some education requirements and this may be something that you need to think about if you hope to have an adult learner on your staff um, uh, or not on your staff, but as a, as a part oh, of your member. Here's the priority now. Okay, so um, the member must have already received a high school diploma, GED equivalent, and they must be enrolled or they must be enrolled in a high school diploma or it's an uh, equivalent. So they must be um, working towards an educational attainment. So um, if there is an issue with that, please let us know if you have an adult learner that you're hoping to, to uh, make a member. And then this is very, very important. Uh, Paul will go into great detail about this. They must pass a criminal history check and you must use these two um, organizations, TrueScreen and free Field Print. Unfortunately, if your city or your county 
your library jurisdiction um, already has background checks and fingerprinting, they don't count for this. You need to, uh, to have your members and you yourself, anybody who is supervising or working closely with members must go through those processes with those particular vendors. Okay, so are there any questions at this point? There's a, a few questions in the chat. If you... oh, great, okay. I have a, a struggle uh, seeing the chat when I'm talking about slides. So let's, let's take a look. Um, will the slides be available for download? Yes, Paul, do you wanna talk about that? Yes, we will have the recording uh, hopefully up tomorrow on our uh, website, which we'll talk about the website. And uh, also we'll make a PDF of uh, the slides. And we'll put also, also we'll put that on the, the website under our training session, the section that we have on the website. And that should be up tomorrow also. Oh, good. So it looks like um, Bev is providing additional information in the chat box and answering some questions just in case um, somebody missed it. Uh, if a member serves more than the minimum hours, I'm assuming they are not compensated with any additional living allowance. No, that is a set amount. So they would be um, volunteering their time on that. Uh, but uh, Bev says living allowances are not compensation, but a member receives a living allowance for the period of their service within the program service year. Okay, and I see Betty asks, do members of the group have an opportunity to meet each other? And guessing during the online training. It's a great question, Betty. It is, yeah. So this is really important. And so we want um, the members to, to feel like they have a community. We will have a five hour member orientation for them on October 13th. That's a way for them to connect. They can also, um, we'll be having monthly trainings for them. And that's a time where they can connect. In these days of um, where we're still dealing with the pandemic, it's a little more challenging, I think, to have in-person gatherings. But um, especially if you have, um, and you'll all know who's you know part, part of this initiative, but if you have a nearby library that has AmeriCorps members, then we hope that you will also encourage them to get together, but we will provide opportunities. We'll talk about some national service days um, where uh, members will uh, engage in service together. And um, also there are opportunities within America Learns, which Lisa will be talking about for members to share ideas and communicate with each other. So if you have any other ideas for how uh, the members can meet each other and, um, and, and get to know each other, please, we welcome them. We think that that is an essential part of this initiative. Okay, uh, Shanti asks, this is living allowance treated as taxable income. That's something potential members may ask. Yes, Paul, do you want to talk about that? Yes, uh, so it's it's we're going to use a payroll service. It'll be a direct deposit, and they will generate uh, the year-end uh, W-2s. And uh, the only the only thing they're taking out is FICA and uh, Medicare, and so that's that's the uh, the members' portion. And uh, they won't take out workers' comp. We have a comprehensive workers' comp policy that covers everybody, so it isn't taken out of the payroll. So we'll we'll need uh, W nines from all the members, um, and but I'll talk about that later. Thank you. Oh, Beth, thank you for the plug for Career Online High School. That would be a great way um, to reach that educational requirement. If we don't have members recruited by October 13th, will you offer the orientations later? Yes, we'll see a slide where we're going to have um, another, we're going to do um, a repeat of the uh, site supervisor and member supervisor orientations. 
and the member orientation in November. So don't worry. And everything's recorded as well. Uh, will there be other AmeriCorps member orientations? Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, and, and we understand um, that uh, several people are, are at different uh, stages of the process of, of onboarding your members. Okay. What's the best way to schedule the background checks and by when? We're going to, let's, that's a great question. And Paul will answer that in his portion this afternoon. All right. Uh, thank you. Those are terrific comments and questions. Is there anything else before we go back? No? All right. Okay. So this is, delving down even more deeply into the information about the program. So this is the timeline question. So we are in at the end of September, just about to begin October. And so this is a great time for you to be um, recruiting, screening, and onboarding members. And um, as you can see, we're having our supervisor uh, training. Some of you will ha just have site supervisors. Some of you have more robust staffs, um, might have site supervisors and member supervisors. And in the, um, the site agreement, it details what the distinctions are between those two supervisory roles. Um, and so we will have, uh, our, of course, our orientation today and then part two next Thursday, 10 to three. And then in October, uh, the official start date for, um, for supervisors is October 5th. The official start date for AmeriCorps members is October 10th. So those are the official start dates. You, you're, you, know, you cannot count hours um, towards the match before that um, that date and and you cannot count them for members before October 10th. Um, but we certainly encourage you to get going on um, the onboarding process for the members before then. So in November, uh, I think we do have the dates for those and we'll be sending those out um, for the supervisor and member training repeats. And then um, after everybody's onboarded. And again, we know that this will, not everybody's going to do this at the same time. And while that is the preference, it's just it's simply not realistic, um, especially um, you know, with, with our, um, our initiative. Um, and so um, members will serve until the end of September. So, what do the statewide folks do versus what do you as local sites do? So um, we provide statewide um, administration and leadership for all of you as an initiative team. So Literacy Works provides most of the support systems. And again, um, I'm your primary contact for anything training related, program related. Um, CLLS is a project partner. And so anything that um, it relates to CLLS program pram, programming, then you would um, uh, talk to Bev as your primary contact. But um, Bev, do you want to say more about um, what the state and what CLS and the state library will be doing as statewide project partners? You bet. Sorry about that for a minute. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I think the important thing to remember, and I think the reason you're all here, is that this AmeriCorps initiative is in service to California Library Literacy Services, um, and that's why it's the CLLS uh, AmeriCorps initiative. Uh, AmeriCorps members will be doing CLLS service, and we provide a lot of training through CLLS, through literacy initiatives. So there will be training for AmeriCorps members, but there may be training that's offered statewide um, through the state library. Um, for example, the state library hosted training from the US Citizenship and Natural and Immigration Services on uh, becoming a citizen. And we'll be hosting a training on uh, the citizenship interview and getting trained to become an interviewer. 
And we also host training through literacy initiatives. And some of you may remember, for example, the three ESL workshops that Jamie Allison Goldstein did recently about working with ESL learners on um, speaking, reading, and writing. So it's a conglomeration of things and we'll let you know when AmeriCorps members are welcomed. Generally, those trainings are open uh, to staff, volunteers, and AmeriCorps members, but on occasion, there is a more limited audience, either because the contractor only wants to teach X number of people or because it's a discussion uh, that is limited to a particular audience, so. And as partners, you know, obviously, as we're um, beginning this initiative and, and getting everybody um, onboarded uh, with it, the, the orientations and trainings that we're doing are not appropriate for CLLS um, programs. But once we uh, get past this onboarding stage, we might have trainings that um, other folks are, are um, interested in too. And so we feel like, you know, the more the merrier, unless there is some limitation to participation. So we're, we're partners, so let's collaborate. So, and then some of you may be saying, well, who is Pacific Library Partnership and what is their role? And they are the fiscal agent. They are the formal grantee or the recipient of the federal funds and the AmeriCorps um, California Volunteer Grant. So what do we do? We provide the site and member supervisors training uh, on everything you need to know about AmeriCorps requirements and standards. Um, we're also providing initial and ongoing trainings uh, for members. So in the past, some of these have been in person. There is no plan to have um, in-person trainings right now. So right now, uh, the plan is to have everything offered virtually. And so we're going to have a wide range of topics, um, certainly AmeriCorps basics, literacy basics, um, networking, CPR, I think, is that an AmeriCorps California volunteer requirement? Just good to know if you're out in the community. And we will also be surveying you. So what are your interests and your needs as supervisor and what, um, and we'll interview your um, members as well. We want to be learner centered, right? We wanna know what you want to be trained on. And then we'll also be providing the centralized background checks and verification. And um, we will, uh, Right now, Lisa and Paul are learning everything there is to learn about uh, how to uh, to work with members in America Online to help them keep track of their time and uh, their performance measures. And so that is our responsibility to work with you on that. Uh, we will also be uh, collecting data from the members progress reports and that involves um, some of the CLLS roles and goals, which you're all familiar with. And then we're also responsible for um, working with the time cards and living allowance payroll. And Paul will be working on that. So in order to make sure that your programs and are the best that they can possibly be, that you are having your best experience, that your members are having your best experience, we will also be providing ongoing trainings and support. We'll be providing feedback to you as sites and supervisors and members. We'll be providing site evaluations. And we hope this won't be necessary for any, anybody, but if any challenging situations arise, we will absolutely be there um, to help with um, any corrective action that needs to happen. Um, hopefully not for sites, um, uh, but for members. So there is a process that California volunteers and AmeriCorps have in place. And so we would be, we would be taking the lead on that. And so then what are the local responsibilities? As we said, you will be recruiting and selecting your members. You'll be interviewing them and checking their references. So you'll do all of that that you would normally do when, when adding a team member. You'll be supervising them, mentoring them, right? Because professional development um, is part of this and training your members. And also you'll be fostering a sense of belonging and success. You want them to know that they're valued members of your team and that um, making them welcome, making them feel like an essential part of your program is your responsibility as well. You must also ensure that your members do not participate in projects that pose undue safety risks 
to them. So we want to be sure that everybody's safe and protected. And so if you have any questions about what that might be, I know Carrie is here. Carrie, you cannot jump out of an airplane using a parachute with your AmeriCorps member. Okay, that's <laughs> not allowed. <laughs> so um, contributing cost share per member, again, a very, very um, a reasonable amount for the um, a good bang for your buck. And then of course, um, most of you are already in the process or have completed uh, signing the site agreements and the MOU to participate. You will provide a workspace um, that is appropriate and, and a nice workspace. I know that um, space is always uh, a challenge for programs, but, but you know, you need to give the member uh, a place where they can, can do their activities. You will be providing um, your own site-specific trainings, your own local. So hopefully you will have upcoming tutor trainings where you can um, teach your members what it is that you do in your program, uh, in your tutoring. And you certainly want to introduce your members to your library, to your communities, to your program, and just make them feel very um, comfortable with their, their member setting. Uh, you will also um, need to participate in statewide training and, trainings and activities. We don't have a, a, a calendar for the year, but we will be uh, creating a calendar and, and sending that out to you. And again, part of that is what do you want and need? And then um, we'll also ask you to be involved in um, helping the members with their timekeeping, making sure that um, it's accurate. Lisa will talk more about this um, and about um, our members meeting their goals, right? Are they, uh, how are they doing on their performance measures? And again, Lisa will talk with you about that for America Learns. So how are we? Oh, Kathy, can I just throw a, a note in? I know it was listed in your statewide responsibilities as CPR training. And I'm going to say the statewide responsibilities, we pay for it. So it's going to, it's impossible to have a statewide CPR training. <laughs> We're not going to send everyone to Sacramento for the day with the Resassa Annie or however they do it now. Uh, we want your members to get, your members have to get CPR training, uh, but they have to do it locally. They can go to their local agency that provides it, whether it's the Red Cross. I know that my city provided CPR training for staff and they were perfectly fine to have AmeriCorps members go to that CPR training and they didn't charge us anything. So look at your options in your community, um, but you would be reimbursed um, for that CPR training. So I know it, it said under state responsibilities, but we aren't literally providing CPR training. We are helping you uh, support CPR training for members. Oh, thank you Thanks, Kathy, for letting me stick my nose in. Oh, no, no, no. I'm so glad you clarified because I, that was a little question mark in my head that I should have asked you ahead of time. So thank you so much. All right. Oh, so yeah, so how are we going to, to do all of this? Well, any way that you can possibly think of to communicate that is what we'll be using. So um, in America Learns, um, I think uh, Lisa, correct me if I'm wrong, you will have an option to, um, oh, I think, Lisa, do they opt in to te be getting texts or do they opt out of getting texts as supervisors? Um, they can opt in. Okay, opt in. Okay. So that's your personal preference, right? If you prefer that um, all communication uh, about AmeriCorps and about your member happens with email or phone calls, that's fine. You do not need to, to, to engage in texting. But if that's easier for you, um, then that's an option too. We will be having um, monthly meetings or webinars. So we'll be having uh, official times where we can communicate. Also, there will be informal and formal site visits. Um, these might be in person, they might be virtual. It just kind of depends on what's going on and, and your location. Um, but there are site visits that are part of this initiative. And then we'll be interviewing you and your members and um, maybe if there are other stakeholders. So um, there will be some formal interviews. And then we just want you to know that you 
have ongoing support from everybody who is part of the statewide team. So please don't hesitate to ask us if, if you need anything. And we will try to get it to you in as timely a fashion as we can. Bev, do you have anything to add? Kathy, I'm adding that you're doing a great job. Thank okay. you. Thank and you. you all know you get plenty of emails from us, but we will make sure they are flagged AmeriCorps. So. Oh, good point. Good point. Okay, so timekeeping, and Lisa will be talking more about this during the America Learns segment, but we just wanted to um, let you know that there are two pay periods a month. So the first period is from the first of the month until the 15th. And the second is from the 16th until the end of the month, whatever day that is. And so members will be tracking their service activities by hours, and then they will submit them one day following the end of the payroll period. So if it's the first payroll period, they will submit their, um, their hours on the 16th of the month. Correct, Lisa? Correct, and I will send frequent text and email reminders to them to ensure that they do that. Great, and again, we you know we trust that everybody is going to to um, have a great relationship and and you know track themselves appropriately. But that is a, a part of a supervisor's um, role is to provide oversight and to to make sure that they are approving the service hours that. Uh, that your members are um, putting into America Learns. Again, Paul will talk more about this, but um, FICA is deducted from the payroll. So the members pay half and Literacy Works pays half of that. You will not see workers comp deducted from the, from the payroll. That is going to be paid directly by Literacy Works. So that will not be a deduction that you see on the paycheck. Um, and can we call it paycheck, Bev? Is it a different, a check that is received by members? Your living allowance check. Living allowance check. Thank you. See, we're all having to, to learn new vocabulary. So the living allowance is paid via direct deposit to the member's bank. So at some point early on in the process, we will need your um, member's bank account numbers. And, and Paul, how do we think that we're going to be getting that? Well, I have a, a direct deposit form that we will put on the website and, and send to all the site supervisors. Um, and, and also the, we'll need information uh, about the member for the payroll that we'll have a, a, a sheet for that also. So the, where the bank is, uh, address, things like that. So any payroll questions, Paul is your guy. Lisa and I do not know anything about that. So um, we are happy to pass along information, but Paul is the one. And then um, there are project goals and performance measures. And uh, Lisa and Paul and um, Susan Vega and the America Learn teams have been working on this. Um, and, and Bev, absolutely chime in. Um, we're, we've been working with the logic model that was um, submitted to California Volunteers, AmeriCorps, in the grant proposal. And so there may be more performance measures, but right now this is where we're at. So recruit and assess adult literacy learners and volunteers, and also participate in training volunteers. Um, planning and presenting family literacy um, workshops. And again, these can be virtual, they can be in person. It's totally up to whatever your program is comfortable with. And then those outreach events that, um, and the learner leadership uh, activities as well. And then um, training is a part of this. So members will be tracking and recording their professional development opportunities. Now, Bev, I keep seeing this thing about 20% of their Yeah, let me explain that. Yeah. So first of all, let me go back to the performance measures. Not everyone is doing family literacy. We understand not every program offers family literacy. So only those family literacy members, uh, the members participating in family literacy have to meet those goals. 
But those folks also have to participate in adult literacy, learner recruitment, assessment, and tutor recruitment. That could be helping to spread the word a variety of ways. It's your typical outreach um, and community engagement. Um, it doesn't have to be their primary goal. The 20% thing that Kathy just brought up. Um, uh, AmeriCorps members are expected to participate in training. You're expected to offer them tutor training. We're expected to offer them training and we'll continue to do that. And we know there's a tremendous amount of online training that's available. Some of you use those online training mechanisms. The 20% cap is this. We wanna make sure a member doesn't sign up for AmeriCorps and spend 85% of their time in training because goodness only knows all of us could do that, right? I, the other project that I worked at is California Libraries Learn and if I had nothing else to do, we could take all those classes all day. 20% is the cap. So a member should not be earning more than 20% of their hours in training. And you do have to mark it off on the timekeeping function. However, when a member starts out, they may be spending all of their time in training. It's just 20% over the course of the year. Right, So there may be many weeks where a member isn't really doing any training, they're just doing service. But over the course of the year, the cumulative hours, whether it's 1,700, 900, or 450, no more than 20% of that should be reported as training hours. So for your 450 hour quarter time members, no more than 90 hours in training. For your 1,700 member, hour members, that's a lot of training, right? Is that 340 hours in training? You can go under 20%, not a problem, but you can't go over 20%. Does that help, Kathy? Oh, so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. And then um, again, Lisa will tell you more about this when she's talking about America Learns, but we know that Roles and Goals is already a great um, uh, system that CLLS programs have in place. And so we don't want to duplicate. We want to um, complement what you're already doing. And so we, there is a question about um, double dipping on adult learners, right? Because if they're in, um, they're working with your AmeriCorps members and they're working with say a one-to-one -one tutor, um, we will be making sure that, you know, uh, a learner's hours are not being counted twice. And so Lisa can work with you on that. Um, and then members will complete monthly progress reports um, on their attainment of those goals. And then supervisors will complete member evaluations. And so that's you. And learners will complete assessments. So all of these things will um, be part of how we're measuring our performance and meeting our objectives. Lisa, did you want to add something there? Or do you want to wait until you're I feel like waiting. Okay. All right. I just wanted to ask. Okay. And now we're just going to talk about some random things that didn't really fit into any category, but um, there are branding requirements from AmeriCorps and we'll go more into this um, next week, but sites must display the AmeriCorps symbol in the office where the member is doing most of the activities and in all of your promotional materials. So Paul, you were saying that's on their website, on any flyers or brochures that go out of the, the office that have to do with the AmeriCorps members activities, right? Not everything they do, just, right. okay. Right, it's like if it's an AmeriCorps, if they're doing service hours and a certain thing, like going into the community, and marketing the literacy program, um, the material that they're handing out should have the AmeriCorps logo on it. Great. And then during service hours, members must have something to identify them to the community that they are AmeriCorps members. And so they must wear their service gear when they are, are performing their activities. And so Literacy Works will be providing all members with one shirt and one lanyard, um, because we know that if you're working five days a week, you want to wash your shirt. And so um, we'll be needing shirt sizes at some point. So um, how do we plan to get the shirt sizes, Paul? Well, I think we'll use our America Learns probably. Yeah, excellent. And or 
or with the other um, when the members are in place we can uh, uh, we could ask the site supervisors under their sizes okay great and then there are national days of service uh, from americorps and california volunteers so members are required you must release them uh, from your site to participate in these events so um, first of all, there will be the, the swearing in, which will happen at the end of the member orientation on October 13th. And then at the end of the, the year, um, there will be a graduation service. And so each member is required to participate in those events. And then um, every week, there is an AmeriCorps week, and that is a week of service. And so this coming year, it will be March 12th through 18th. So that is all the information that we've been provided with at this point. Um, I think this is a work in progress for California volunteers and AmeriCorps, but when we know inf more information about that and what kind of activities, um, we'll let you know. And then um, there are other days that are not required, but AmeriCorps, California volunteers, and we, of course, as people who really support um, these uh, federal and statewide entities um, really encourage you to, uh, and this is a great way, of course, for your members to meet other members and, and build camaraderie with them, um, that there are these other national service days. So Martin Luther King Jr. Day, Cesar Chavez, um, National Volunteer Week, and then National Day of Service and Remembrance, which would be at the end of their service year. So members can participate locally. So if there's something going on um, in um, your area for Cesar Chavez Day, they're certainly welcome to participate in that. But if there's something say in San Francisco or Los Angeles or um, wherever, they certainly are um, welcome to attend that too. Kathy, let me just throw in, I know that many libraries are closed on Martin Luther King Jr. Day, they're closed on Cesar Chavez Day, uh, and it is possible to do those days of service if you want to do a local library-based event on a day that is close to one of those days. We under, you don't have to open the library, you don't have to force other people to work, um, or you can serve in another organization's day of service, so members can serve on that day even though the libraries are closed, but we, we ask this question up front. Uh, to California volunteers and they're like, okay, yeah, we get it. Your government organizations, you're probably closed on those days. So yeah, good point. Thank you. Okay. We are um, not going to spend a lot of time on this graphic. We know it's very busy and a little bit hard to, to read, but this is going to be something that um, you will have in, in the slide deck. Um, and so this is every, you know, people are saying like, what's the, what's the flow of this? You know, what, what activity should I be doing right now? And so you're posting, you're interviewing, you're selecting your members, you're then inviting them to enroll in e-grants, which Paul will talk about. Um, you're completing the background checks, which Paul will talk about. You absolutely need to make sure that their citizenship status is um, appropriate for, for this. Unfortunately, um, no um, uh, DACA members are eligible for this opportunity. Is that right, Bev? So you can be- That's, a that's correct, Kathy. Uh, it, the, Amer the AmeriCorps College Corps, and which is very active in California, does accept DACA or DREAMers, um, but not AmeriCorps state national programs. So you need to be a, a citizen or a legal or natural naturalized resident. Um, and then members start, and that's so exciting. Now, number seven, days two through seven, finalize all members and enroll in e-grants. So the first week, your, your members must be enrolled in e-grants. And again, you'll, you'll learn more about that and how to do that. Um, some onboarding tips, and again, we, we're encouraging you to do this as soon as possible. We know that many of you have challenges in that area, but all of this does take time. This onboarding process takes time, so please start now, and please develop a tracking system for all of these steps so that you know that you're not missing some of them out, and then you have to go back and try to fix that later. 
We know that many of you will continue to recruit and onboard your members after the official start dates that we've given you for October. That's just being realistic. Um, what California Volunteers and AmeriCorps tells us is that often if members join late, there are some mistakes made in that onboarding process. And so please be vigilant. That's why the tracking system will help you make sure that you're hitting all of those steps along the way. And they're also saying, um, you know, go through all the steps no matter when the member comes on board. And their suggestion might be, okay, say you have people who are coming on board later than, you know, maybe starting in them at the same time. Okay, rather than individually. It's a little bit less because many of you will only have two members. So this is so important. And Bev, you may need to chime in. But so late start members do not get the entire living allowance. Okay. So it's not like, oh, well, if I if I started in November rather than October, I get more money every two weeks than somebody who started in October. It doesn't work that way. It's the same yeah. bi-weekly or monthly amount for as many months as they serve. So this is another huge reason for onboarding your members as soon as possible so that they can get as much of that living allowance as they can. They will miss out on the living allowance if, uh, if they join later. So because it's not an hourly wage and because it's not a salary, it's not doled out proportionate to the number of hours served in any pay period. And that may mean that your, for example, your quarter time hours, quarter time members who have 450 hours, if they start right away and uh, they dole out it's 10 hours a week for uh, 45 weeks, then, then it does look proportional. But you may have members who say, uh, you know, or you may be recruiting someone, you don't start them until December. The clock on their living allowance starts when they begin. They will not receive the full living allowance. They'll only receive it uh, in biweekly installments for the term they serve. However, if somebody serves their entire uh, hours, the entire set of hours, they do qualify for the education award. If a 1700 hour full-time member serve 1,650 hours, they do not get any piece of that education award. They may earn their full living allowance, right? So a full-time member may, for whatever reason, um, not serve their 1,700 hours. They'll still get the living allowance for the period of time they serve, but they won't get the education award. And that's the part that really sweetens the deal for a lot of people. Why is this true? It's true because it's not a wage, it's not a salary, it's not granted proportionally to the number of hours you serve. It's a little bit of an awkward fit, but we want you to understand this upfront. So if you're telling people um, who are uh, serving part-time um, or half-time that you will get a living allowance that's equivalent to, now I can't even remember the amount, is it $9,000, Kathy? I can't remember. They're not going to get the full $9,000 unless they start with the first living allowance pay period. Um, so you'll just need to explain that to members. We understand that some members may be starting late. Some programs may not have been able to fill the slots, um, but we want you to know upfront that that is a condition. It's a condition for all AmeriCorps programs. And that is because this isn't a wage. It isn't a salary. And the, the last point, which is you need to make sure that your members have enough time left in the calendar year, right? Left in the, in the initiative year to be able to attain their hours. So this is less of a challenge for those of you with quarter and half time members, but this is definitely something to think about if you have full-time members. So what questions do you have? I see, oh my goodness, the chat box is very full. Yeah, there, there are a lot, and I, I want to make sure that particularly we get to Nicole's questions, which are important. Okay. So. Why don't we uh, go ahead? So why uh, I, it's going to take a minute to look at them. Uh, what are Nicole's questions? Why don't we start off with those? Okay. Well, actually, I'm going to go in the questions in, in order. And the okay. first question, um, I believe, 
um, uh, is if we don't have members recruited by October 13th, will you offer orientations later? And I believe you did address that. This will be recorded and we will offer, a, is that right, Kathy, a second round of orientations for late starters? November, yes. Okay. Mickey asks, what's the best way to schedule the background checks and by when would they need to be completed? Mickey, we're gonna have a whole section this afternoon. Paul's gonna teach us all about background checks. And if your question doesn't get answered then, bring it up again, we promise, okay? Uh, we, we've held off on the background checks because there's a really specific process for doing it that makes sure that we pay for it and you don't have to pay for it. So Paul will help you with that. Um, so Nancy asked, is there any paperwork that explains how people will be taxed? Uh, you would like to have a written um, explanation. Um, sure, Nancy, we will look to see what California Volunteers has for that, but essentially it's the same as standard payroll taxes. So the FICA is Social Security and Medicare essentially that's taken out um, and that's um, um, generally um, what's taken out, but people also have to file a W-4 and we'll, we'll look up for a better explanation than that because I'm no tax expert. Um, Nancy Next also question. asked, Okay. Kathy, do you want to throw something in there? Paul will be able to address that as well. Okay. Yeah. Paul, when we were talking about the payroll section. Are AmeriCorps monthly meetings virtual or face-to-face? -face? Kathy, I think you answered that. Uh, they will be virtual, but we encourage face-to-face -face meetings. If you have a regional network meeting, for example, I know a lot of those are still virtual right now. So Alex asks, is September 2023 a hard deadline for AmeriCorps members to complete their hours? If our AmeriCorps members start late, can they complete their hours past that September 2023 date? Um, Alex, it, it is because we have to close out one here and report on it. Um, that said, and I wrote back to you about this, I did once have a member who had a compelling health reason where she got to have a postponement. Uh, so she was out um, for a medical reason for three months and she was able to extend into the next year. That's the only time I've seen happening. Uh, late start, you want to get people to complete their hours. It is totally fine. People can complete their 1700 hours by with a late start. They may miss one of the a couple of the living allowance uh, things, but we do want to have hours completed by the end of September 2023. That's our agreement uh, with the federal government. And and there is an opportunity if we all do very well to extend this uh, for three years. And so that's the other reason because then we'll be we would be starting into an, a new uh, uh, initiative year. Exactly right. So Betty asks, is it okay for us to attend the training for members so that we know how they've been trained? Absolutely, we want you there for members. If you can't be there, we know you're busy people, we'll record it. Uh, some of the training will be a little repeat of what you've heard today, my section will be, um, but a lot of it will be new. And we want you to have that training so that you can communicate with members, you can be a resource for members and you're all on the same page. So that thanks for asking that really excellent question, Betty. I appreciate that. Uh, Betty notes that she took an online CPR course. We will check and see if that is acceptable. Um, I know the cost for those. Um, I just looked it up and it says it looks pretty cheap. So um, Tim asked how quickly do after we have to complete CPR training? The county does it quarterly. I don't know the answer to that, Kathy, and I don't know if do you know the answer. I remember members getting it during the service year, so it, you don't have to have it uh, on day one. So we'll find out for you if there is a uh, time restriction on that. Um, Nicole asks, and here are Nicole's questions. The first one is, looking at the signatures needed on the site agreement, can you please, ex please explain the difference between site supervisor and member supervisor are both required? So Kathy, I'm gonna turn that over to you. Yeah, so it there is a really explicit comprehensive section in the site agreement that outlines those differences. But, and, and so I, I, we don't have time to go into that now. I could absolutely do that with you one-on-one, -on -one. but basically, um, not everybody is going to have both a site and a member supervisor. If you are a smaller program with a smaller staff, you might only have a site supervisor and that's perfectly okay. But let me let me give you an example. Um, when I held Shanti's position uh, as the literacy coordinator at uh, Reed Santa Clara in Santa Clara City, most of my time was in meetings. I was on the library management team meeting. I was going out to the community. I was having partner meetings. 
I would not have been there in the office a lot of time to provide support for the AmeriCorps member. So in my um, situation, I was fortunate enough to have Karen Masada as the assistant coordinator. So in that case, I would have been the site supervisor. Karen Masada would have been the member supervisor. So you, you must have a site supervisor, but you may have both a site supervisor and a member supervisor. There are different um, roles and responsibilities that are outlined very distinctly in your um, site agreement. So, but I'd be happy to talk with you offline about that. Yeah. And I would say in my experience, I was always the member supervisor and the site supervisor and everything else. So <laughs> it was a one person, one staff person program. And I think what we have been asking people to do just because more signatures seem to be better um, that if you are only one person, then go ahead and sign in both places for site supervisor and member supervisor on the, on the site agreement. Nicole also asks, the MOU states that payment of the cash match is due tomorrow. Please elaborate. <laughs> so Paul, I'm going to turn that one over to you or to you, Kathy, um, and then just say, yes, it is due tomorrow. But Go ahead. You've been... Well, Bev, do you want to twist arms? No, no, it's it. No, it it. We put that, and we would like it due to be due tomorrow. But I have talked to uh, several of you, and that's just not possible because you have to put it through your uh, city manager, or it has to go up the chain. And so, it, all all I would like to do is talk to you and if you can give me a reasonable date when it's due, then uh, we can put that in our database and uh, bug you a little bit, you know, when it's due. So getting- so Just get remember that yeah. the living allowance is partially funded by that, so. Yeah. Right, right, yeah, it is. So we need it as soon as possible, but I understand, uh, I'll give an example. Some, some sites have said, well, we're not getting our uh, LSTA money till November. Um, can I do it? Can I uh, have the check in November? Well, if that's the only, if that's the only amount of money that you can um, uh, tag for this, then I, I guess that would be okay. And Bev, Bev has been uh, very, uh, CLS has been very good about uh, saying you can take it out of your ESL money and other other ways. And you still. You still are offering that, right, Bev? Or yeah, is that yeah, absolutely. The member contribution can be paid yeah. out of any portion of your CLLS money, okay. whether that's adult literacy services, family literacy services. But if you need additional money and you are an ESL funded program, you can request additional ESL money. You can't request right. additional li adult literacy or family literacy money, but you can allocate those funds. I know that that programs, um, you know, most libraries have been continuing to pay your salary. Uh, the, the check is coming. You've signed. Your, you've all signed your agreements. I think at this point, um, uh, but Paul is the person to talk to if there's any challenge. So right. So just I guess the bottom line is, see see if you can uh, use those other other funds uh, to pay, and 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 if you can't, and you have to wait until the funds come in. So, but please talk to me and let me know if you want to extend. Uh, the September 30th uh, date. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. It looks so, like I caused some confusion by talking about double dipping for learner hours. So, um, Kathy, thank you for uh, that question. Yeah. So, go ahead, Kathy. Go ahead, Beth. Okay. So, Kathy and I asked AmeriCorps matches can't be counted on CLLS report as CERT learners? Yes, they may. Um, if you were reporting them on two reports to the same agency, so for example, you know, you were reporting them and as ESL students and as adult literacy students, that would be double dipping. This isn't double dipping, you're doing the reporting for separate purposes. So it's totally fine to report those learners on your final report. They should just be counted in with the pool of your regular learners, but you also want to track the activities of your AmeriCorps members and their outcomes, uh, their performance measures. So. You'll be, you'll be doing some, some double data collection probably, uh, but you will report um, these learners on the CLLS report. So. 
Diane, um, no, they don't always have to wear the shirt. Um, and so it's it's either or. I think when the shirts are um, most important is when they're going out into the community. Um, every picture that you see of AmeriCorps uh, volunteers, everybody's wearing their, their shirt. So on their service days, uh, outreach events, um, no, they don't. Photo opportunities. Yes, yes. So, um, you know, it makes them feel like, you know, they're they're part of this team, but no. Um, and yeah, if somebody would prefer a button rather than a lanyard, um, you know, that. I think the buttons are cheap. We might be able to swing that. We'll see. Okay. <laughs> um, I do want to say, however, um, that one of the things that's really important is, and you guys know this, that building relationships with your fellow library staff members is super important. And you want to let everybody know, right, from the director to the clerk of the page who's shelving books, that this is an AmeriCorps member. It's not a library employee. You want to be super careful that, um, that library employees uh, don't think this is another library employee and they can be expected to answer the same questions or do the same kind of work. So you do want to, just as you would for any staff member, you do want to take your AmeriCorps members around and introduce them. And when you have new library staff members, introduce them. And it's a great time to show off the lanyard or the shirt or whatever they're wearing and say, you can always tell this person is an AmeriCorps member by the lanyard. You sometimes may have this happen. You may have staff who think that some of your tutors are library staff members because they're there in the library so much. It's the same sort of relationship building that you need to do in that case. But the lanyard's a good sign. And you, you know, may also have a volunteer badge or something else your library requires folks to wear, and that's fine too. But so, they have to have an AmeriCorps logo on. I'm sorry. I know that we had scheduled you to start your slides at 11:15, Bev. We yeah. will. Have Plenty of time at the end, um, but we we have some guest speakers coming, and so I'm thinking, why don't we go ahead? We'll we'll pay it. Please know we're we're going to get to your questions. They will be answered, but um, I think for the sake of staying on track um, with our guest speakers, why don't we go ahead and and have you go on to your segment now, Bev? Okay, great. So Allison's going to load up the slides. And I'm going to give you a little background information. As you know, um, working with California Library Literacy Services, I'm always exhorting you to do good work. And we're trying to say yes to as many things as humanly possible. But for this presentation, which is the same presentation that your members will receive, with a nod to James Bond, I'm going to be Dr. No. Right? So here are the things you can't do in AmeriCorps. This orientation from California volunteers and AmeriCorps California uh, AmeriCorps California, Allison, if you go to the next slide, talk specifically about prohibited activities and unallowable activities. Next slide. Prohibited activities, and here's why. Here's the reason this exists. And I'm gonna read you some stuff because some of this stuff is really important. This is a federal program and it enjoys very wide bipartisan support. Every year, right, it needs to get funding. And under the Serve America Act, it includes a lot of real, rules and regulations, including what are called prohibited activities. Next slide. So this is in order to maintain the broad bipartisan support for AmeriCorps. Activities that are particularly politically sensitive were excluded from being an allowable part of member service. These also apply to staff on the grant while charging your time to the grant. These activities are also connected to the Hatch Act, which governs federal employees' activities while on the clock. I just wanna say, almost all of you are government employees. You understand there are certain things you cannot do while you're on the time clock. This is an extension of that and it uh, applies to AmeriCorps members federal regulations, and it also applies to your time, uh, what you mark as the supervisor's time on the clock under federal regulations. Next slide. However, you can do whatever you want on your own free time. Right? So all of these things that I'm talking about, prohibited activities, it's not prohibited. I mean, we know there are things that like murder, right, that are prohibited. Don't do that on your own free time. But any of the political activities we're talking about here or other activities, you can still do on your own free time. And the same thing is true for members. Next slide. While charging time to AmeriCorps, accumulating service or training hours, or otherwise performing AmeriCorps activities, staff and members may not do the following activities. You may not attempt to influence legislation. Next slide. You may not organize or engage in protests, petitions, boycotts, or strikes. If you're striking at your library, don't put it on your AmeriCorps time card. 
You may not assist, promote, or deter union organizing. You can't do union organizing. Most of you can't do it on your time card anyway. You cannot impair ex existing contracts for services or collective bargaining agreements. Next slide. You may not engage in partisan political activities or other activities designed to influence the outcome of an election to any public office. You may do this on your own time. You may not do it in time charged to AmeriCorps and members may not do it on their time charged to AmeriCorps or, wear, or while wearing an AmeriCorps logo or clothing. You, uh, you may not participate in or endorse events of activities that are likely to include advocacy for or against political parties, political platforms, candidates, proposed legislation, or affected, uh, sorry, elected officials. Next slide. You may not engage, and members may not, on their time card, engage in religious instruction. They can do this in their off time. They may not uh, engage in religious instruction, conduct worship services, provide instruction as a program that includes mandatory religious instruction or worship, construct or operate facilities devoted to religion, maintain facilities, devoted to religion or engage in any form of religious proselytizing. Next slide. Members may not do activities that provide a direct benefit to a business organized for profit, a labor union, a partisan political organization, a nonprofit organization that fails to comply with essentially the political lobbying restrictions uh, for section 501c3. Um, and they may not provide a direct benefit to an organization engaged in religious activities unless AmeriCorps assistance is not used to support these religious activities. Great example, your member may be tutoring in a church that offers in-kind space, but as long as they're not providing religious instruction, they're okay. Next slide. Members may not conduct a voter registration drive or use AmeriCorps funds to conduct, an AmeriCorps reg uh, to conduct a voter registration drive. Members may not provide abortion services or referrals for receipt of such services. And there may be other activities that AmeriCorps uh, may prohibit. Next slide. So as I said, AmeriCorps members may not engage in those above activities directly or indirectly by recruiting, training, or managing others for the primary purpose of engaging in one of the activities listed above. So Amer AmeriCorps member cannot recruit a volunteer who will provide religious instruction, for example. Next slide. However, individuals may exercise their rights as private citizens and may participate in the activities listed above on their own initiative on non-AmeriCorps time and using non-AmeriCorps funds. Individuals should not wear the AmeriCorps logo while doing so. We're all government employees. We understand these restrictions, I think. Next slide. Here's the, the I don't know why AmeriCorps thinks the F-R-A-P is an acronym you'll remember, but if for some reason you do, these are the big five. Prohibited are voter registration, direct benefit for for-profit companies, religious activities, abortion referrals, political activity, and advocacy. Do it all on your own time. Can't be done on AmeriCorps time. Next slide. Is Starbucks coffee prohibited? Uh, yeah, actually, there's a reason Starbucks is on there. It'll appear in a couple more slides. An AmeriCorps member can't say, hey, I'm teaching this class, I'm drinking this great Frappuccino class, let's go out and everybody get a Frappuccino. No, that is a prohibited activity. So you wanna be careful about commercial endorsements. It doesn't mean you can't drink something, it means you can't endorse it. Examples of prohibited activities include political advocacy, campaigning for a candidate while on the service clock, voter registration or voter registration drives while on the service clock. That doesn't mean you can't give information about how to register to vote, or about voter information, how to access that. You just can't sign people up as voters. Um, you can't protest against or demonstrate for any type of legislation. Next slide. Uh, religious instruction, examples of prohibited activities is leading a prayer service, teaching adults on a religious text or practices to children and adults in any setting. This one may be interesting because sometimes learners request to read a religious text. Um, you probably want to be careful there. You just want to be safe. Let's let's work on other tasks and maybe a volunteer can do that. Um, religious instruction, you can, uh, members cannot testify or engage in activities that are meant to engage individuals in or convert them to a particular religion. Doesn't mean you can't wear your symbol of your religion. You can't wear a necklace with a cross or a star of David, but you can't try to convert people. Next slide. When do these restrictions apply? Number one, while you're serving, 
even if you forgot your gear that day. And number two, while wearing AmeriCorps gear. So if you walk out of the library, but you're still wearing that t-shirt, you can't do it, right? So take the t-shirt off, take the lanyard off, um, just make sure you're not wearing that. So during any worker service hours that are funded by AmeriCorps, whether it's the federal share or the grantee share, uh, it applies to the personnel listed in the grant budget. So Kathy, Paul, Lisa, and I all have to follow this and, um, and it applies to you. And it also applies to community members recruited and managed by AmeriCorps members. So that's the one we probably won't be able to track that, but just keep it in mind, right? The same way you tell your volunteers, don't endorse political candidates when you're talking to a member. I mean, you're talking to a learner. Don't tell them how you vote. The same sort of common sense practices would happen here. Next slide. When do they not apply? When it's your personal time, individuals are always free to exercise their rights as citizens when not charging staff or AmeriCorps member time to the AmeriCorps grant. You run into a friend in the street, you go, let's go to Starbucks. That's fine, as long as you're not wearing a shirt or you're not saying it's AmeriCorps activity to go to Starbucks. Next slide. Here's a scenario for prohibited activity. I'll read it, you read it yourself as well. And then there's a question at the end. I just want you to post your answer in chat. Next slide. Here's the scenario. Members serving your program want to petition city council. Member, these members recruit and work with learners and tutors, and the city council is considering cutting funding for your library literacy program. The AmeriCorps members are concerned that the program will be negatively affected by these proposed cuts. They argue the city's budget has nothing to do with their AmeriCorps program, and they should be allowed to petition city council and earn AmeriCorps service hours for doing so. Is this a prohibited activity? Put it in chat. What do you think? Every answer I see is right. Yes, this is a prohibited activity. No, no lobbying, no going to city council meeting and arguing against budget cuts. So this is a prohibited activity. Good job, AmeriCorps site supervisors. And Next, what if they do it on no. their own time while not wearing their gear? They can't represent themselves as AmeriCorps members serving at the library. And unless they are have some other relationship with the library, they shouldn't indicate a relationship with the library. So good question, Kathy. Next slide. And here is what's prohibited. They're attempting to influence legislation. They're organizing or engaging in protests. They're participating in or endorsing events or activities that are likely to include advocacy for or against political parties, platforms, candidates, legislation, or effective, uh, elected, I keep saying that, elected officials. Next slide. Here's the second scenario. Again, be ready to answer in chat. Your member gets the 2022 Easy Voter Guides, which by the way, are already out and also available online and shares them with adult learners. One learner asks the member, who are you voting for for state treasurer? How do I sign up to vote? The AmeriCorps member tells a learner that she cannot speak about a candidate, but she names the party that she generally supports and provides voter registration forms to the class and provides class time and assistance in filling out the form. All right, looks pretty prohibited, right? Members can talk about the Easy Voter Guide, talk about it as a nonpartisan source of information. They can tell people how you sign up for vote, how you prepare to vote, but you can't say the party that you support and you can't do class spend class time or tutoring time helping people fill in the form. You're absolutely oh. right. This looks prohibited. Kathy? Yeah, we have a, a related question from Carrie. Yes. In the what if an AmeriCorps member is helping their learner complete their voter registration form as part of their lesson? Is that prohibited? Um, yeah, I would say don't go there. I would say don't even risk it. Don't even go there. So you can talk about the form, but actually providing assistance. If that's, um, if that's conducting a voter registration drive, assisting with voters registration, don't do it. So could they facilitate their learner getting help from somebody else? Uh, you can always say, you know, that service may be available elsewhere. You know, some libraries do not help people um, fill out forms. And that is a very clear stated policy. So follow your library's guidance on this one. Um, but AmeriCorps members should just probably stay away from this, which is different than saying, staying away about talking about how important it is to vote. How do you get voter information? 
how do you access the forms? So just steer clear. So good advice. Thanks, Carrie. Next slide. <laughs> And here it is, that's engaging in partisan political activities by saying what party you support, participating in or endorsing events or activities that are likely to include advocacy. So that's the prohibited activity and the letter of the law. Next slide. So Bev, I'm sorry, yeah. just some follow-up questions. So um, Shay asks, could another literacy volunteer help a learner fill in the voter registration? Shay, I'm not gonna answer that question right now. That is really, um, I'm not prepared to answer that question. Uh, and it really does depend, I think, on it may be the policy of your library. I just work in different environments. So you might wanna have that conversation. Um, so Diane says you provide forms and information through Kita and community. That's fine, as long as you're not conducting a voter registration drive. There is a fine line here, a voter registration drive is usually you're out there at the table, you're saying, hey, strangers come in and register to vote. But I would just say, be super careful with this. You don't want to ding the whole program. I know voting voting is so important, right? That is why we support Easy Voter and other uh, voting information projects, but just be really careful with it. Um, so Easy Voter does provide an explanation for filling out the voter registration form. Yeah. And it's okay. fine okay. to have the Easy, Easy Voter guides in their programs, right? Yeah, it's absolutely fine. It's fine to read an Easy Voter guide with a learner. Um, on the other hand, you may not have uh, members working with uh, learners before the, the election. So maybe this is kind of moot, but elections happen every year and they happen multiple times a year. So I would just say, be really careful with this one, right? Be careful because you can't always control what people say. They're like, yeah, I really like this guy, right? Or I really like this candidate. Just, we're gonna try to steer members away from politics, any partisan political activity. Okay, next slide. In addition to prohibited activities, there are unallowable activities. Next slide. Um, these relate to keeping members from causing issues with labor uh, organizations to your city, county, as well as simply seeking to be always uh, having the best use of taxpayer dollars. Next slide. Put it simply, um, to put it simply, we want to ensure AmeriCorps members are doing the service they're funded to do as described in the awarded grant. Things like tutoring, recruiting learners and volunteer tutors, participating in outreach events. These things are described in the member's position description. Next slide. Activities that fall outside of the scope of the grant performance measures and position description may include member training that exceeds the 20% aggregate rule, which I talked about a few minutes ago. Next. Federal and state assistance that serves as the sole activity of a member for the sole purpose of referring individuals to a federal assistance program or state assistance program funded in part by the federal government. AmeriCorps members uh, do not spend their time referring people to, um, or do not spend all of their time referring people to human services or tax help or whatever it is, right? They, that's not usually within the scope of an approved performance measure. Um, also unallowable are activities that would violate the non-duplication and non-displacement requirements. And I'll explain what those are. Next slide. Non-duplication, corporation assistance, and that's federal AmeriCorps money, may not be used to duplicate an activity that's already available in the locality of the program. It doesn't mean that members don't tutor because you also have volunteer tutors, but you really want to be careful that you don't invent something that already exists. Hey, we're going to have an ESL class at Tuesday mornings at Cleveland School. Well, what if adult ed already has that class? Don't duplicate that class. Next slide. Non-displacement. An employer may not displace an employee or position, including partial displacement, such as reduction in hours, wages, or benefits as a result of use of an AmeriCorps member. This is really important. We're going to look at some scenarios about this. Next slide. Organizations may not displace a volunteer by using a participant in a program using corporation exist, uh, assistance. I don't think you're going to be firing your volunteers. Uh, I don't think this is going to be an issue for you, but a service opportunity will not be created in this chapter that will infringe in any manner on the promotional opportunity of an employed individual. Um, if there was an opportunity for someone to move up from library clerk one to library clerk two and, that, and a manager says, hey, we don't need to do that that year, be, this year because we have AmeriCorps members, that's unallowable, right? This is specifically um, for your library hiring practices. Next slide. 
Um, also unallowable is a participant may not perform any services or duties or engage in activities that would otherwise be performed as an employee as part of the assigned duties of the employee, right? So this is a really, really big one. You can't displace an employee. Your management can't say, oh, we used to have someone who worked a quarter time in adult literacy, but now there's an AmeriCorps member, I can take that person's quarter time and put them in the reference department. That's a no-no, that's an unallowable activity. Next slide. Non-displacement, a participant in any program may not perform any services or duties or engage in activities that would supplant the hiring of, of employed workers or supplant the recall rights um, pursuant to a collective bargaining agreement. This might've been relevant a year or two ago where a lot of people were furloughed because of the pandemic. You can't say, oh, we're not gonna call back this person because there's an AmeriCorps member doing their job. Most people have already called back folks, furloughs have ended, um, but you should just know that this is in the letter of the regulations. Next slide. Okay, here's the scenario. Use the chat to respond. AmeriCorps members are serving a library literacy program that, that lost its staff member six months ago. The city has a hiring freeze, so the program hasn't filled the position. The site supervisor thinks that asking the AmeriCorps members to do some of the tasks specifically done by the former staff member, such as filling out reports, for example, bringing in time cards, is a way to build the capacity of the program. The capacity of the program is lost because of the staffing void. Allowable or unallowable? Super duper unallowable. All of you writing in chat, you're absolutely right. This is unallowable. Next slide. Scenario four, AmeriCorps members are serving library literacy program in which all staff members as part of their work help with special events. Your member service agreement references events as acceptable activity for members. As a result, the site supervisor plans to have the member work at a special literacy event as part of their service. Is that allowable or unallowable? Thank you, Shanti and Regina, Nancy, Victor, for, for going out there on a limb. It is allowable. Carrie, you're right. It may depend, right, if it's usually exclusively part of somebody else's work. But these are usually all hands on deck events, right? There will be some overlap in work. This is an allowable scenario. Next scenario, AmeriCorps members serving library literacy program in which literacy program staff perform library duties when needed. On days when the library is short staffed, and we know this happens all the time, the site supervisor assigns the AmeriCorps members to staff the reference desk during the lunch break of a library staff member. Allowable or unallowable? You're right, totally unallowable. This happens all the time and there's AmeriCorps super vigilant about it. We, we don't want it to happen at all. I know a lot of AmeriCorps members who've served uh, at, at schools as tutors, and then they've had the principal say, hey, can you do playground duty? And the answer is no, absolutely not. You absolutely can't staff the reference desk. You can't shelve books um, outside the literacy center, but you can't do the job of somebody else in the library. It is totally unallowable. And I think, Allison, that's the last slide. And I'm on time. I went rushed through that, but believe me, guys, you're going to hear this again and again, and you can refer to it. You can cite it. If you have any questions, go ahead and put them in chat. Uh, and I know we have lots of chat questions that may be unresolved. Thank you for your help on this. I really appreciate it. Wow. To the minute. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. Okay. So I haven't seen any questions in the chat about um this particular topic so do just please take the opportunity now um to ask because this is a super important topic we, we don't want to have any violations but you can keep asking throughout the year right there's you don't have to know everything to start with you've got the big picture in your head right uh, and then if something comes up ask yeah, we just wanted to make sure everybody had this information at this point, because certainly as you are customizing your position descriptions and um, planning your interviews and really using this time as a planning reflection time to think about how can members build capacity in my program, you, you need to be making these considerations. Oh, we do have a question. Uh, Shay, what if we have a digital literacy class that usually is run by a volunteer, but we no longer have a volunteer to do that? Is it okay to have the AmeriCorps uh, member lead that class? 
yes, that's totally fine. As long as they're not displacing a volunteer, you're not telling the volunteer, hey, don't, we don't need you anymore, right? That volunteer left on their own before the member started. And um, Carrie, yes, very important question. Um, we will have one formal break from 1245 to 115 for lunch. Absolutely, we know this is a long day with a lot of information, just as in face-to-face uh, uh, -face training, please take care of yourself, get up and do what you need to do um, in informal personal breaks throughout the day. But we will be taking a lunch break from 1245 to 115. All right, are we ready to move on to my presentation? I think we are. And again, if, if something occurs to you about unallowable and prohibited, just put it in the chat box and we will address it at the end of the day. All right. Hello, everybody. I am Lisa Thompson. I am the project coordinator for our initiative. I will be a new face to all of you in the library literacy world. Um, I come from a background in volunteer recruitment and management and database management. So that's what I bring to the table. But I have lots to learn at this new project. So I'm really excited to get to know all of you and our members and more about the program. Um, I've gotten my training in this America Learns platform, which is the one that will handle all our operations focused portions of the initiative. So this is where we're going to keep all our documents, do all our surveys, keep our time cards, and I'll be telling you more about this program in my presentation today. So America Learns calls their uh, platform an impact suite, and there's going to be lots of new vocabulary that you're going to get to learn. Members are referred to as reporters and other such things. Um, this is kind of what the landing page will look like for supervisors and for members who will be using the platform. Uh, it has a place for logging in, and then there will be a mission control desktop area where you will be able to access all parts of the program that we will be using. Um, here are some of the functions of our impact suite. It will store the profiles of all our members, our learners and supervisors. Um, we will collect and report our data through this uh, platform. We will generate our progress reports and track our CLLS roles and goals. Um, it will also be where we handle our timekeeping, um, where our members will enter their timekeeping hours and our, our supervisors will approve them. Uh, we will keep track of all of our member files, and we can sign documents right here uh, through Sign Now on this platform. It'll be also a communications portal. As we mentioned earlier, we can text each other, uh, we can email each other, and um, also turn off that option for texting if that's what we prefer. And it also, uh, this portal supports growing and learning in our program, and it does encourage member strategy sharing through a special uh, place on the landing page. Um, I know some of you are familiar with America Learns and you've used it at your library sites. And so that's really great because it'll help give you a, a, a leg up on using it here. Um, so talking about the profile area where members and learners and supervisors enroll, um, after this presentation tomorrow, I will be sending all supervisors an email invitation to uh, set up their member profile area. I've entered you all in um, according to the applications that we got, and so the supervisors who apply to the program will be getting the invitation. Um, if there are others, like you have a member supervisor and a separate site supervisor, I only got one name, let me know, and I'll also enroll that person too under that library system. So you'll get this email invitation through America Learns from me, and you will be invited to go onto the website and get site set up. Um, after I receive uh, information that you have set up your profile, then I will send you a personal email asking you to send me the names of your members who have signed up so far. I'll also be asking for other demographic information that we will need to get started in the program. Um, and then once we, as Literacy Works, um, have enrolled your members into the eGrants program, which we will do on our end, um, we the 
member will get invited from eGrants to sign in, sign up, and complete the rest of their profile information that we need. Um, what's going to happen is I'm going to need a social security number for every member, and I don't want you guys to send that to me via an email system. So I will be, after I get information from you about who your members are, I will call you and ask you for social security numbers for your members, um, something that maybe you collected already on their application or something that we can get that way, or you can refer me to the member themselves and I can call them to get that information. We just want to keep everything as confidential as possible. Um, down the road, our members will then, once they're enrolled in the program and get started, they will enter their learners into the system and track their goals and progress in regular reports. Um, so another aspect of things we'll be doing is collecting data and reporting data. This is going to be a big part of our platform, and then we're going to do it all here. Um, so our members will be required to complete monthly progress reports for all their service activities, and that includes the one on one tutoring that they do. They'll do if they do family literacy tutoring. I know some programs won't. They will be tracking the CLS roles and goals, which um, most of you are familiar with. Uh, they will be talking about the outreach events that they've attended um, and the number of learners and volunteer tutors they've recruited and time spent on other literacy projects, plus all sorts of other information. Um, this is how we're going to measure our performance and keep track of all of our data. Um, and this will help us to grow our program, improve our program, and also meet all our requirements through the AmeriCorps program. Um, our members will be available to get texts or email reminders to complete their reports. Um, that is my job. I can keep track of everybody who has something due. Uh, they will receive an email saying your progress report is due on this date. It's available to fill out. And if I see that they haven't completed it by a certain time or a supervisor hasn't approved it or looked at it, um, I can send them email and text reminders to make sure they get it done. The reports can be viewed by the supervisors. And what happens when you go to look at a report, you can request edits within the platform. So you look at the report um, and then you can email directly. There's a button to email directly to the member, ask them for an edit. If you see one, the member will get that email and they can take the link directly into the report and see what you mentioned and make a change there and resubmit. Um, we're also going to be collecting all sorts of other data, and I don't even know some of the data that we're going to be collecting yet, but I will know soon. <laughs> So again, we've talked about timekeeping and America Learns platform is where we'll be doing all of that. So it is an important thing that we're going to teach you and then teach the members. Again, there's two payroll periods. Uh, members are required to keep track of their hours and break them down into their roles or activities, including tutoring, assessing their community outreach, any training they've received, um, work during national service days, leadership projects, et cetera. We're going to get very detailed um, accounting of how they are spending their hours and track them so we know that they're meeting um, their what they were supposed to be doing for the program. Um, they will receive their text and email, email reminders to submit their timesheets by the last day of the pay period, and that's my job to stay on top of that with them. Um, once a member submits their timesheet, you as the supervisor will receive an email asking you to review it for accuracy and approve it. Or if you found an error in it, you can send it back, uh, an email back to the member asking them to um, fix uh, the error that you found. And then they can resubmit it, you approve it and sign it, and then we move forward into doing the payroll part of it. Uh, America Learns is fully compliant with the AmeriCorps agency timesheet regulations, and, they're, um, and they have all the security measures in place to protect that information, too. Um, another big area for the platform is the member file management. So we're going to keep track of all of the required paperwork that is necessary um, for them to be in their position. So we will collect it, store it, manage it on the platform, including the member service agreement, member service description, their letter of commitment, any photo releases, uh, their W-9 forms, their background check files and photo IDs will be uploaded there. And you as a supervisor can go on to the member profile and see whether they have completed all of these various steps. So if you're wondering for a particular member, 
oh, we're going to be having photographer here. We're going to be taking pictures. Did they sign their photo release form? You can look on their member profile and see if that box is checked off um, and look at their photo ID if you need that too for your own purposes uh, within your program. Signing documents. It's really nice that we have the ability to use the application uh, sign now within the, the America Learns program. So um, we can sign documents, documents that are um, created in there and uploaded in there specifically. So we can turn member service agreements, enrollment forms, letters of commitment, and photo releases into sign digitally signable documents, have them exist in America Learns, and we can access them there and sign them, um, and members can sign. And then supervisors or program staff um, will be a emailed when a document is ready to be countersigned if that's necessary. So it can all be completed digitally. Um, the communications portal, which we spoke about again and again, is that we can initiate texts and emails within the, within the program. What happens is if you are going to contact a member within America Learns, they will receive an email in their personal email account, um, which will say you've just received an email from your supervisor within America Learns. They wanted to give you um, information or ask for an edit in a certain document or uh, progress report you've done. There will be a link in that email that will take them back into the American Learns program. They can also directly respond to you from their, that email, and that will go to your personal email box too, not within the America Learns um, platform. For example, if a supervisor notes a mistake on a member's timesheet, they can request an edit with an email generated from within the timesheet page. And the email will have a link directly to the timesheet in America Learns. Um, one thing that I want to explore more and that America Learns is really excited about sharing is um, an area on the platform where members can share their strategies. So America Learns encourages members to reflect on their strategies that they have used that have enhanced their tutoring, outreach, and other roles. And they want them to share their strategies with our staff and other AmeriCorps members in the program. There is a place to upload descriptions of strategies used with certain learners and upload files of maybe worksheets or other handouts that they have used that they've had success with. And those um, will be shared with other people in our AmeriCorps program and accessible from the home page uh, where we log into it. Um, and you would see that this link right down here is on the home page and people can go straight to it and look at strategies. Okay, so here's about training. How will we learn all about this platform and how will our supervisors, you train your members on certain areas of the platform? So there's definitely a lot to learn here. Um, and I haven't learned at all yet. So training for supervisors. So once you guys complete your online profiles, I will email you instructions on how to do different functions on the platform, starting with the easier things into the more difficult areas. Um, there are short training videos and slide decks that have been supplied by America Learns. I will send you the links to those. Like this is a slide deck for the timesheet review for supervisors. It'll give you your bird's eye view of how these um, programs are working. Um, and then there will be also a support area directly on your homepage of America Learns. Uh, you can press that button. Um, you can email the America Learns um, staff, and you'll also have a phone number to call. In addition, there's an online support center uh, that have videos and slide decks on them too. It's a knowledge base area with boot camps. Here's the boot camp for timesheets, um, getting support, accessing your account. There's endless areas where you can learn more about if you have questions. And then training for members is going to happen sort of in the same way. Once they complete their online profiles and they have been um, put into the e-grant system and the poll process is going, we'll email them instructions on how to use the different functions on the platform along with videos and slide decks. Here is one, um, our members are again called reporters. Here's one about document signing as an example. Um, so, 
which part of training our members uh, do I, as program staff, engage in with them and which parts do the supervisors engage in with them? So the supervisors are responsible for ensuring that they know how to efficiently navigate the America Learns platform and ensure that they're trained on how to complete the following activities, timesheets and progress reports, including the roles and goals. So I will be helping you to learn these things. And then I will be also giving instructions to the members, um, giving them references and the videos on how the, to do it. But it's really at the end, an area where you will need to be able to ensure that they understand it by sitting down with them if they are having difficulties doing any of these things. And so we will be getting a lot of training on this beyond what I'll even talk about today. Um, we'll continue more of this type of training in our next orientation next Thursday and um, through our monthly, our monthly meetings and any other time that we need to talk about it. I know it is a lot and, um, and the onboarding will be, will be a um, steep learning curve. So in terms of our training um, for the members also, the part that I will be responsible for ensuring is that they get onboarded onto the platform, um, that they on in a timely manner submit their timesheets and progress reports. So I'll be the one who's monitoring whether they have done those activities. And then ongoing, I will make sure that they have signed all documents that need to be signed, up uploaded all required documents, just to make sure that we've dotted our I's and crossed our T's, that they have all their required paperwork in place. So in conclusion, uh, this is a new platform for many of us, um, including the people on my staff and some of you supervisors and our members. Um, our America Learns um, trainers told us that it is an easy to use platform. And I know that with patience and the support of America Learns, that it'll be a benefit for our initiative. And if you have any questions, I want you to contact me directly. There's my email address right there. And of course, I'll be giving you my uh, cell phone number in our emails when we communicate in the future. And again, understand this is just an overview of our system. It, we will be getting way more in depth in it and learning how to use it efficiently. And so uh, don't panic yet, and I won't panic. <laughs> so does anybody have any questions right now? Uh, Susan is in the house too, if, if you want to refer to her. Wonderful. So Susan Vega is the, um, the America Learns uh, customer service representative and support person who trained us. And so I'm so glad she's in the house because um, if there's something I can't answer, then I'm hoping that she can. So let's open up this chat here. Let's see. Uh, where, how far back do we go here? Oh, she's already been answering questions. Love it. Um, okay. If we already have America Learns, will this be part of our program site? or is it a separate site? It is a separate site. It is our Literacy Works AmeriCorps uh, program site there. But you can talk, toggle between your two sites um, if you're using the same email. Um, how many learners do you expect on Americ an AmeriCorps member to tutor? Does it have to be in a one-on-one -on -one group or group atmosphere? Um, there are so many different ways that they will be tutoring, right? One-on-one, -on -one, uh, family literacy groups, all sorts of different ways. As whatever the site has decided is, you know, the programs that they want to carry out, it can be done that way. And within the progress reports, there are ways to address um, whether you did a one-on-one -on -one learner and how to record that and whether you did a family group or a larger group and how to record all of those roles and goals for them. Um, Let's see, Bev answered some great questions here. Um, let's see. Let's see here. <laughs> we already addressed what the difference between a site supervisor and a member supervisor is, Nancy. Um, and and that, that's in the, Kathy, what do you say the document that's in? 
Yeah, it's in the library. It's in the Literacy Works and Library site agreement. I'm actually just scrolling through it at the moment. Um, it, it's a long um, part. I was going to try to cut and paste it into the um, into the uh, uh, chat box. Okay, and then Alex asked if we have an AmeriCorps member running small tutoring groups like a conversation club and a drop-in tutoring class, does the AmeriCorps member need to do a roles and goals sheet for each unenrolled literacy learner that attends? And Bev answered that one. We want members to enroll learners and serve enrolled learners. Otherwise, they're serving other library patrons and that may be an unallowable activity. It should be possible to help each participant to set or claim a goal. All right. Well, if we understand that a member may be running a conversation group, but we want to be able to count their time and to count their activities moving towards a goal. So we've had these discussions with lots of programs. Uh, if you collect basic information about that learner and you have a conversation with them about setting a goal and it can happen in the context of that class, then they are enrolled learners. So whatever your standard, the standard is for enrolling learners. Uh, if it's just open to people and you don't record people's names and we don't collect any data on it, then that's generally um, not something that we would count on the CLLS report. And it's not something that would probably count for the AmeriCorps initiative. It's a great question though. Okay. Um, Kathy just entered information on the distinction between member supervisors and site supervisors um, and took the language out of the library site agreement so that you could see it here, but it also exists there and she showed where to reference it. It's um, very so. Okay, and do we have any other questions about America Learns at this point? Um, or Susan, if I made a glaring um, and egregious error in my presentation, could you please let me know that too and let um, our supervisors know? You did great. That was a great um, compilation of, of, our, of our training that we did. Um, <laughs> which is great. And that was uh, actually, I was also in awe of your your PowerPoint. <laughs> it was beautiful too. <laughs> but um, yes, I assume there'll be more uh, questions once you dive into the um, the site and you get a chance to get familiar with it. It is, um, it's pretty, it can be overwhelming, but just like anything, the more practice you have, the more time you spend with it, you, you'll love it. And, um, and it's, it's, it's going to be great, I mean, especially when it comes to the roles and goals. You will love how it's compiled and how easy it is to get the data out of it. Um, but with training um, or questions, just because if training ends for your site supervisors next week, that doesn't mean we are gone from you. Um, if you have questions, you can always refer to that support. Um, re defer to Lisa first and then um, for any questions, but anything that just sound, looks strange on the tech side of things, just send us uh, emails at support.americalearns.net or go to the support um, link on your your site. And, and Susan, I just have to mention that uh, and tell everybody, Susan was on the original uh, CLS AmeriCorps program back in 2004 at National City. So she really understands AmeriCorps, which really has helped us as we've uh, developed um, our America Learn site. And, uh, and, and so we have a real expert here to help us out. So thank you, Susan. <laughs> I, and I was looking at the comments and okay. I remember the blue ink signatures. I do remember that. And um, the, the time for those of you who were um, programs were CLS AmeriCorps programs um, back then, um, the timesheet is much, much, much easier than the Excel spreadsheet. Georgia worked her butt off on that, but um, yes, you it will be much easier to access for both your tutors. And the best thing is that they can do it on their phones. Mm -hmm. And when will the app be available for, for phone use? So the app that's still in development, but the site itself is mobile friendly. Um, so you they can just log in. If they check their email on their phone, they see the link to turn in, to enter their timesheet or their time, they can click on the link and it will take them to their to their phone. And it's all it looks 
clean. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Any other questions for Susan or comments? All right, wonderful. I did see um, a question that just popped up in the chat. Are member supervisors required to have a criminal background check as well? Yes, they are, as well as our AmeriCorps members. Um, and Paul will cover more of that in the um, background check portion of the training today. And I did just want to, to add something, and Susan, maybe you can um, say more about this, but going back to the slides where we were talking about how we, we want this to be a very meaningful, um, gratifying, rewarding experience for the AmeriCorps members. We, we want it to be equally and mutually beneficial, not just that the, the sites and the libraries and the programs get um, something out of this initiative. We really feel strongly that the members should also get something out of this. And we know that um, sometimes placements don't work. And we, we actually got an application through the, the America on um, AmeriCorps portal from a very unhappy camper in another AmeriCorps um, placement in a, a different part of, you know, nothing to do with our initiative. And he felt like his um, talents and his um, skills and knowledge were not being put to very good use and that he was just being kind of used as a, as a gopher worker bee. And so we do not want that to happen. Um, and we do not anticipate that it will happen in any of our wonderful programs. But just as a little checks and balance on that, um, we have asked America Learns to put in a function or to activate a function that will allow us to have private communications with members to, to try to, um, to resolve any unhappiness or dissatisfaction that a member may have with the placement if they don't feel comfortable for whatever reason sharing that with their um, supervisors or if they have shared it with their supervisors and it hasn't been resolved for them um, to their satisfaction. So Susan, do you wanna speak to that function a little bit? Yeah, we um, there's several ways you can that can happen. One is through the communications portal. That's one way to get um, for um, if you want to to start the, the conversation, or if the program managers want to start the conversation with the learner or the learner, excuse me, the the member. Um, but there will be a, a section in the member file that's only visible to. Um, the certain certain mem certain staff members that allow for some um, some private notes or conversations between the um, you and the and the members. So we wanted to be very transparent about that. Uh, we want you to know that that is a function and that members may choose to use that. Again, we, we do not anticipate uh, the need for that, but just in case we felt it was important to have that function built into the system. Thank you, Susan. Thanks everyone. It looks like we are done a little early for lunch. It's 1215. Well, I think, you know what, before we break, let's just, this is a good time since since we're uh, ahead of schedule, which is amazing. Um, let's just absolutely make sure that we've addressed all of the questions in the chat box. Maybe you did that while I was um, thinking of other things, but is anybody up, up to speed on whether we've answered everybody's questions? We have not answered everybody's questions. So we right. did Could stop the verbiage from the site agreement into the chat box about the distinction between uh, member and site supervisors, um, but uh, it's far too long. Uh, you're limited to how many um, characters you can write. So um, I, I can certainly send that out uh, in an email to, to people after this. But, and I know that there were some questions about, oh dear, you know, what, what we put our library director as the site supervisor and our literacy coordinator as the member supervisor. Totally fine. Several people have done that. That is absolutely fine. What are some of our unanswered 
Um, Diane asked if there was a tracking system template available for us to use as a starting point. I'm guessing, Diane, that you are referring to all of the hoops that the members and the supervisors need to jump through to get the system going. Um, we will be um, tracking everything and using America Learns as our way of making sure that everything is done. And then we will be letting you know as supervisors um, your part in getting um, our members to do certain things um, when they are supposed to be done. Um, I don't believe we have a document specifically ready with that, but we can make one um, like a project timeline, um, when things are due, what official dates are for like starts and stops and that type of thing. We can make that available for you and share it with everybody. And we just uh, had a question from Diane about um, when is the member orientation scheduled? And that is going to be from 12 o'clock to five o'clock on Thursday, October 13th. Um, there was the question uh, from Alex, if our AmeriCorps members start late and therefore do not receive the full amount of their living allowance, does that mean our local contribution would be lower. Um, did anybody answer yeah. that? Yeah. I did answer it, and the answer is no. Okay. Uh, the, the, the member, the site contribution remains the same no matter when a member starts. You said you're going to be Dr. No, so that's I, I'm, that's good. I'm, I'm a bureaucrat. I'm really good <laughs> with no. no. Um, Abigail asked, who do we send our budget? Mod mod I'm thinking that's modification, not medication. Who do we send our budget modification request form to? Uh, you can send that to Allison um, for the CLLS slash ESL budgets. And Allison repeats, if you'd like to augment your 2022-2023 CLLS ESL funds, for example, adding more funds, you can use the same BCR form and send that to Allison. The funds will be awarded separately um, from your CLLS ESL funds after approval. Okay. And did we already address that it, it, it's up to you all what setting you would like your AmeriCorps members to tutor in. And um, <clears throat> Bev, I, do you wanna say a little bit more about the, the goals for the state initiative that we're trying to reach? Yeah, um, absolutely. So the goals are a cumulative number of learners, a cumulative number of, um, of goals achieved for learners, a cumulative number of learners uh, feeling engaged by learner leadership programs. So they're not specific um, in terms of the outcomes for each particular person, but there is a target for each member for tutoring as an activity. It's called what America calls, AmeriCorps calls the dosage, right? Um, and I know from example, working with AmeriCorps members who have served in my local school district uh, as tutors for kids, the dosage was to work with kids six to eight hours a day, and that's a big dosage. Uh, we do have the target for full-time members uh, of tutoring two hours a day, but that may happen in a lot of different ways. It may happen in running a book club or other activities. It may happen, it may do a slow start, and it may happen when people are filling in for other people on vacation. So it's not uh, a cut and dry requirement. You have to come in that day, do your two hours of tutoring and leave. It's a little different for halftime and quarter time members who have a weekly suggested um, minimum daily allowance, if you think of it in, in vitamin terms, um, or recommended daily allowance, but it's really cumulative, right? So it's just to keep you on track. So there isn't um, the very formal structure to their day because we know that every program is different. Um, so does that help answer the question, Kathy? Does that get you think of the, of the idea? Oh, yeah. I have uh, uh, Sabrina and Diane. I have a uh, Diane have a question about the matching uh, funds. And Sabrina says, uh, "How do we submit our matching payment due tomorrow?" Uh, well, I'll give you my personal address, and you can drive it down here. How's it? Little joke. Little joke. No. Uh, <laughs> no. Actually, it's okay. Just uh, put it in the mail. 
And if you need an in invoice, um, Diane, Diane, uh, just uh, everybody, just send me an email and request the invoice, and I will send it to you. So um, again, the goal is trying to get get the matching funds in by tomorrow, but I understand uh, that can't always be possible. So just let me know, uh, write me, tell me when you can get it in, uh, ask for an invoice and I'll send one right off to you. All right, anything else to cover before we break early for lunch? Diane, we do note that there is a CLLS, uh, a final report question and answer session. Uh, all of these will be recorded. Choose which one you wanna to go to uh, and know for the CLLS final reporting, you can always make an individual appointment with Allison. Um, so, or you can just get the recording of that meeting that's happening the same time, the last hour of AmeriCorps site supervisor training on Thursday, October 6th, a week from today. Yeah, what time are we coming back from lunch? 1.15? 1.15 is when we start our presentation on the background checks, uh, the national criminal history checks. Well, so let's, let's um, check in with folks because we had originally planned to stop for lunch at 1245 and to give people a half an hour. So that would be giving people um, much longer than a half an hour. So it's um, what, what do people prefer to do to take more time now in the middle of the orientation for lunch and catching up on things um, or to, to um, go ahead and and a longer break would be nice why don't why don't we say split the difference and just say come back at one okay okay yeah let's how about let's start at one does that work for everybody is that helpful yes 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 that works for me yes sounds like every <laughs> Yes, it's been a information. Yes, we know it's a little information overload. So mm -hmm. uh, we, we That's under some fresh air. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. I just want to say everybody did really well on their prohibited and unallowable activities quiz. Good so job. thank you so much. Good job. Good job. And please keep the questions coming. This is a great opportunity to uh, have them answered. All right. Okay, we'll see everybody back at one o'clock. Okay, so no questions while we wait a minute or two. Everything crystal clear? Okay. Uh, okay. All right. Well, I think I think we're ready for background checks paul background checks the fun part I need those. yeah okay let me get on there there we go okay everybody um hope you had a good lunch and i know normally you'd be taking a 15 minute nap now and as i would uh, I always love coming right after lunch and presenting because everybody's wide awake, you know, <laughs> but that's all right. I'm up to the challenge. I'll, I'll talk louder and, and be more animated. Um, so what we want to talk about now is uh, a very important part of the process of onboarding your applicants, because they're applicants at this point, they're not members yet. Uh, and that's uh, through the National Service Criminal History Checks. Um, and we're using true screen and field print. And uh, the reason this is so important, these background checks are, are, can be costly because AmeriCorps takes it very seriously. Um, they, take, they take the safety of everybody very seriously. 
So late and missing incorrectly done background checks uh, can lead to serious financial penalties uh, for the CLS program. Okay, and and uh, we we were given this example when we did we did our training with uh, California volunteers about uh, one of the programs had to pay back one hundred twenty five thousand dollars because they didn't do their background checks properly. So that's an incentive for us. We, we want to we want to make sure everything is done uh, correctly. And so what I'm going to talk about is what uh, True Screen and Fillprint are, and what uh, how to uh, have your member access uh, those uh, those websites to get their fingerprints done and their and their background check uh, through the let's see it's the uh, sex offender registry nationally. Um, okay, so what are the what are the parts of the background check? So we've got uh, True Screen, uh, which uh, checks to see if your applicant is on the National Sex Offender Registry. And what happens, it comes back to uh, Literacy Works, it comes back to us, and we check and we it, uh, do what's called adjudicating in that we see if they came back uh, cleared or not cleared. And uh, if they're not cleared, they get a chance to defend themselves. And if they're cleared, they're, they're fine. And that's the same thing for the uh, fingerprint-based FBI check, fill print. And, and that's looking for any criminal activity. Okay, so who's required to have special background checks? I'll just say blank everybody that is involved in the Your AmeriCorps program. So site supervisors, um, anybody that works directly with the AmeriCorps member, and then the AmeriCorps member is 18 and over. Um, and so this, this includes, and we put, because there's a question between the site and the member supervisors, that would include both the site and the member supervisors. Okay. So uh, when, are there done, when are the background checks done? All background checks must be completed no later than a day before the start, including member orientation. So that means we're having the member orientation on the 13th. So all the member, all the uh, background criminal history checks have to be done before that, okay? And luckily they only take a couple of days to do, but you can see we're running out of time here. So um, this is really important because they're not really a member yet until they're cleared on the history checks in both True Screen and Fill Print. Okay, and also in eGrants. Um, what eGrants does when we submit the members or the, or the appli applicants information, we submit their social security and then eGrants checks their uh, citizen, citizenship status through that. So that, that's important too. And we'll talk about eGrants in a minute. Um, so again, this is, this is important. Staff and members time can't be charged until the, uh, uh, to the grant until their checks are fully completed. So how are they done? They're done through True Screen and Fill Print. Everybody must use True Screen and Fill Print. Okay, and, and uh, the background checks, as I said, take a couple of days. So we say more than a few days just to, to scare you into doing them earlier rather than later. <laughs> so, um, so who's ineligible if, once they go through these checks? <laughs> So any individual is in, uh, ineligible to serve or work on AmeriCorps grant if they refuse to take the background checks, make a false statement um, connected with the checks. So if they provide a false ID 
or send somebody else to do the fingerprints, that, that would disqualify them. Uh, our register are required to be registered as a sex offender. And that's what uh, True Screen does. And they checks that. Uh, have been convicted of murder, which that would be a disqualifier just about anywhere, I would think. But um, that's that's what the fill print does. Uh, it checks the FBI listings on that. So, and then beyond these minimums, it's really up to you uh, to determine the suitability of the individual based on the population served, okay? So I guess an example would be if, you're, if your population is mostly Latino and, and you wanted someone that spoke Spanish, that would be a, that would be a qualifier um, for your program. Um, let's see. So just a quick overview, true screen and fill print, conduct the checks and provide reports to their portals. And that, that's what we check. So you don't have to go and set up an account with uh, true screen and fill print. We do that. Um, the, your prospective applicant does have to go in and provide the information. So they have to go in and, and set up, uh, uh, their password and provide the information. And then uh, we receive uh, the report back. If there's a criminal history, two screen and fill print, uh, use their background checking to, um, to tell us if they're, they are cleared or not. But it also, if they, if they are uh, not cleared, it, it allows the applicants to challenge the results. Okay, uh, literacy works. We will make the final clearance decision, the adjudication step, in each vendor system, and then uh, we we uh, fill out the California Volunteers verification form on each of the the members. Um, and let's see. So we we also have to attest that we've completed all the checks and e grants. So that's important when we get to the e-grant uh, section, I'll talk more about that. So here, how do you get the, the background checks done? Uh, we will send you uh, after this training um, a sheet and how to, this exact sheet that I'm showing you right now that shows you how to link into the site and, and what the, the numbers you have to use. So what's important about this, so, um, we we are paying for these checks so you have to use the numbers that we're giving you um, or the member does when they or the applicant does when they go into the uh, application uh, program so true screen has what's called an application station uh, you go in there and set up your account and then it, it directs you into true screen and ask the uh, applicant to ask, I'll answer all these questions. And it'll ask uh, what's the prime grant number and there's the number right there. So again, that's important because again, we are paying uh, for the cost of these. And, and so this will direct it to us and our credit card. Same thing for fill print, uh, fill print for the fingerprinting. So there's there's the uh, to schedule an appointment. There's the the link, and that's the code that we're going to use. Okay. Um, so here here are the direct instructions. So the supervisor directs members to visit the application station link. Uh, they create account using the sign up now but button. And uh, if returning, I don't, you know, if, if they've already set it up, that's fine. After signing up, you'll be again asked to log in with the credentials you've created in step two. Um, oops, sorry. So there's, I went back, sorry. 
here we go. Uh, True Screen's application uh, uh, also includes the online instructions that there's a code that you, you're going to put in when they ask you, and there's the code. And, and if requested, I think they always ask this, case reference number. There's, there's the reference number. So again, that, that allows us to get the results and adjudicate and uh, say the, um, the applicant is cleared. So if you have any questions about any of this information, uh, please uh, call me or contact me. And um, if you have any technical issues, here's the number for uh, the application station of getting, th getting through. And that's for true screen. And then uh, field print's a little different. So supervisor uh, needs to instruct the member to visit field, uh, field print uh, site there, and there's the URL. And it's going to ask you to enter an email address under new signers sign up. And you click the sign up button, uh, following the instructions for creating a password and a security question, and then click sign up and continue. And then you enter the field code. This is the, the field print code. So this is our specific code right there. And then uh, the applicant enters the, uh, all the information that they, the, that's required by the FBI. And then they schedule a fingerprint appointment at, um, near, near them. There'll be a list. They'll put in their zip code and it'll give, up, it'll give a number of sites that they go and get their fingerprint uh, at. And at the end of the process, make sure they uh, print their confirmation page because they have to take that to the appointment. Okay, and again, if you have any customer service issues, there's a number for that, or please contact me. Okay. So, any questions so far? I don't know if anybody put any questions in the chat. Um, and see. Paul? Yes. Here? Iram joined us, and I know she needs to leave in about 12 minutes, so. Yeah, Iram, do you have any? Yeah. Iram is our, um, our representative from California Volunteers. She is our, our wonderful program specialist. Program specialist. So yeah. every, every time you ask a question and we say, good question, we don't have an answer for that. Let us check with our program specialist. That is Iram. So we have been we have been keeping Iram very busy lately. <laughs> Hi everyone. Uh, thanks for letting me just pop in. Um, I just wanted to quickly introduce myself, but also give you all just a welcome. And um, so I'm Iram Jabbar. As Kathy said, I'm a program specialist with the AmeriCorps Department at California Volunteer State Commission. Um, so I have been working really closely with Kathy and Paul and Bev and Lisa, the whole team, um, to sort of get this all started. Um, and I just, I just wanted to share how excited we are um, at California Volunteers to, to be able to fund this program. And um, also want to highlight, you know, in my role, I do get to hear from a lot of AmeriCorps members across the state. Um, so I want to emphasize just how critical, you know, your role as a site supervisor is in really shaping the AmeriCorps experience for your members. So thank you for being here and for, you know, embarking on this journey to build this incredible program for Californians across the state. We're really excited about it. Um, and so, yes, I will be here, um, you know, just in, for another 10 minutes to field any questions, but really throughout the whole program year, I'm, I'm here as a resource. So um, whenever you have a question, like Kathy said, you know, if um, if you ever have any questions, please reach out. And then the team, you know, Kathy and Paul and everyone will reach out to me um, to hopefully get you a, ta a timely response. Um, but yeah, it's really, it's great to, to be able to see you all. So, so Aram, uh, I like, I like to give you the chance to uh, rebut anything I said wrong here. 
Does it sound pretty you good know, so far? That was great, Paul. I would just add one um, one point um, about eligibility versus suitability. Um, so I don't know if you want to go back to that slide. I don't know if you have to, but um, you know, we so at AmeriCorps there are those two basically reasons why a member would not be eligible to serve based on their criminal history check. Um, so one is the being on the national sex offender list, and the other one is being um, convicted of murder, a type of murder. I think, I don't know what degree, um, I don't have that memorized, but yeah, convicted of murder defined by, yeah, I think it's like second degree murder or something, or first degree. Um, my point here is that, you know, beyond this, you know, if there's something that comes up on a criminal history check that um, the program does not you know, deem suitable uh, for this member to be able to serve at their site for whatever programmatic reasons, um, you do have that opportunity to, to have that um, be a requirement. So um, this is really, I guess, looking at it as this is the bare minimum of when AmeriCorps says that a member cannot serve um, based on their criminal history check, but there is, you know, more leeway. Um, so I just wanted to highlight that um, in case that wasn't clear. Okay. Thank, thank you. But you covered everything, Paul. Great job. I did? <laughs> Do I get an A? Yes. <laughs> thank you. This is, Aram's our teacher, so she gets to give out grades. <laughs> okay. Um, well, then let's move on. So enrolling members in e-grants. Well, we actually have a couple questions. Why don't oh, we, we do? Them? Okay. I, I was Why looking at it. Okay. Yeah. Some of them were answered. Who pays for the supervisor's background checks? And that is Literacy Works will be paying for it. Okay. Um, Betty asks, she's already been fingerprinted and checked uh, by, in, and most of us are at their local jurisdictions. You have to go through this specific process. You have to use uh, the two checks that are specified by AmeriCorps, um, which are certainly probably different than what your city did. Nancy asks, are our members using personal email or will they have an AmeriCorps email? And, and Lisa, if you can chime in here. Um, when I was AmeriCorps site supervisor, we made sure everybody made an AmeriCorps specific email at some point in the program. It can happen the first week using a free email service. At the time, it was Yahoo. And so my um, member, Nora Oaks, was nkoliteracy at yahoo.com. You might want to use Gmail. It's a little more current now or whatever free server. Um, or service you can you can come up with, but sometimes it's very helpful for members to not intermingle uh, their service emails with their personal emails. Um, so Lisa, if you have anything to add there for America, uh, America Learns or anything like that, that might be helpful, please, um, please add it in. I don't have anything to add to that. Okay, great. Okay, um, so Shanti has a question. I have okay. a question. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. While we still have Iram, um, yes. I, yeah. uh, let's take advantage of this because I, there, there's always been in everything that I've um, attended on this, there's been a little pushback from sites. And I think it's understandable, especially if they very recently been through their own uh, county or city or library jurisdiction background checks. What is the rationale that um, California Volunteers AmeriCorps gives for not accepting those background checks that seem to be acceptable to other um, government entities? Why, why do you require the specific uh, field screen and true print? Yeah, the other I, you almost got that. I feel for entry screen. I, <laughs> I wish I had a great reasoning here. Um, and I will say this is an AmeriCorps policy. Um, California Volunteers has tried to push back as well. Um, and we have actually gotten a little bit of um, a waiver. So I, I would say the I, I don't act, honestly, there's not a great rationale from AmeriCorps that I've heard. Um, I, I know that I think that their statement is that they want to make sure that everything is streamlined and that everyone's doing the same approach for equity and this and that. Um, the one uh, sort of waiver that California volunteers fought for and did get was that for the FBI check, if you have a recent, um, if you went through the Cal DOJ, that would actually be able to transfer it, as long as you haven't had a break in your employment of over 180 days. Um, so if um, if you have had a Cal DOJ 
FBI check, we can talk um, that that might be able to cover you for the FBI. So that, that means you wouldn't have to do the field print portion. Um, other than that, we still, you know, would have to have everyone using true screen and getting that either a field print or a Cal DOJ FBI check. I have a I have a good reason to use uh, true screen and field print is that that's what we are set up as literacy works uh, to go in and check that the applicant and member is uh, uh, can be adjudicated. If you go through another system, we have no access to that system. And in order for that member to be that applicant to be, become a member, we have to okay them through through field screen and uh, field print, and also e grants. So if you use another system, I don't know how we could possibly adjudicate them and say that they're passed. I, that that sounds that's that's a good reason for for me, and another financial reason would be that we're the grant is paying for this so you wouldn't have to pay for it you know, if you went if you if you would have to pay for it if you went to another system so um th those are two good reasons that i can think of uh to use fill print and true screen yaram do you have any thoughts on that so um because that seemed to be discouraging people from asking for that uh, exemption for Cal DOJ. Um, is there a way so I, that Literacy Works could then um, adjudicate because they would have some uh, proof of the background check? So the, uh, the waiver in this context would be only for the for employees, site supervisors, or for employees on the grant. Um, the members do need to go through a, a new, like they all need to use field print or Cal DOJ and it would have to actually be another check. So um, it might save some time for, you know, for staff members, um, but um, yeah, I mean, Kathy, we can talk about that. Um, it is an option. So for site supervisors who have not had a break in their employment of more than 180 days, um, and they have a Cal DOJ check and they have access, you have to have your ATI number. So there's a little bit you know, of work there too. You have to have access to your record for proof so that we can have that on file. And when you say a recent check, do you have a time frame on that? Um, actually, it's as long as you haven't had a break of oh. 180 days, then it won't be an issue even. If, but I do think that with the Cal DOJ checks, I think that having access to the record might expire after a few years. I'm not sure how long. So it's as long as you have your ATI number and you can actually access the record that it was cleared. Great. So if any of you have had that check, then please ask us and then we'll we'll talk with Aram about that. Thank you, Aram. Anything else for Iram before she heads off to yet another meeting? Can we, uh, hum oh, you have to leave right now, Iram? Yep, she's got a hard stop at 1.30. Okay, I wanted to get into e-grants before she left, but okay. But I will definitely look out for any questions that come up that weren't answered in this training. Okay. Um, so we can, we can talk offline after. All right. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a good Thank rest you. of your orientation. Thank Bye. you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Any other uh, questions? Uh, now she had a question about um, staff who are billing to the grant needing a background check. I don't know what this means. I know site supervisor, um, member supervisor, and AmeriCorps uh, members need to be background checked, but who else would be the staff? Oh, that would have been good for. For Iram, I, I think it's only those people whose time is accountable and is being tracked for the staff. So as a member supervisor, site supervisor, you, you will have to track uh, your AmeriCorps time, but I don't think you know, your library director doesn't have to do it. Does that, and that Bev, sound about right, Paul? I think, that, I think that's exactly right. Thanks, Bev. 
And yes. that is because of the in-kind contribution that we're saying that libraries are contributing, that that yes. needs to be tracked, that yes. supervisor's time needs to be tracked because we are counting that time as uh, in-kind contribution from the libraries to the grant. Is that correct? Yeah, that, that is exactly right, Kathy. That's exactly right. So we do want to show AmeriCorps requires that we have a match. Um, and some of that match can be in kind as well as the cash you provide. Otherwise, you guys will be having to provide a lot more cash to get your AmeriCorps members to make that match. So you do want to document your time. It's actually, I know it's a little bit of a pain for you, but it's actually saving you cash in the long run. Uh, I see Cassandra asked if you have a third staff member working with them, they should also get a check, right? Uh, background check. Paul, uh, any comments on that? Yeah, I would say um, err in the uh, side of caution. So if, you, if anybody is working with AmeriCorps members, have them get their background checks. Yes. Yeah, I, th I think it may be covered in that side agreement. I'll I'll be looking yeah. looking that up. But since we're it, it's not going to hurt, and and we are paying for it, so I I would I would get the check if you're if you're in doubt. You can always call us to and ask. Okay. It says um, in the site agreement. It says, work with library sites. This is Literacy Works. We'll work with library sites to ensure library staff supervising AmeriCorps members meet the background check requirements. These site supervisors must have criminal background clearance. Um, so I think that it would answer Shay and Cassandra's question, what counts as working with them. So it is the, the designated site supervisor. Mm -hmm. It says at library sites, this is the CLLS literacy coordinator acting as site supervisor. At non-library sites, this can be a paid staff member. <clears throat> okay, does that, does that answer everybody's? Questions about that? Okay. All right. Oh, what counts as working with them? Hmm. I think in the what I just looked at, it it specifically mentioned supervising them, didn't it? Yeah. Collaboration doesn't matter. We understand um, that your members. We hope they will be collaborating with other library staff members, but those members, those library staffers won't be the supervisor, right? Um, and, and unlike a lot of other AmeriCorps sites, uh, you know, I think that most library employees are background checked, um, but it's just for the person supervising the AmeriCorps member. Uh, it's not everybody in the library they can possibly have contact with. Yeah, it definitely in the site agreement specifies those supervising the AmeriCorps members. So I don't think collaboration. Yeah, if you're if your peers and the the um, staff member, the team member has no supervisory role over the AmeriCorps member, then I do not think that they need to have a background check. And Betty, thank you for pointing out Fran's question, which I will post again. What's the deadline for background checks for site and member supervisors? And I would say you have you'll have the codes. We'll send you out the slides. And do it as soon as possible. Um, it, it has to be. It ha they have to be completed before the first day of service for members, um, and then uh, before supervisors' hours can be counted. Is that right, Paul? That that's correct. And it is an online process. It's not the same thing where you went to the police station and rolled your fingers on the ink pad. Is that complete? Is that, am I right at saying that, Paul? No, actually, you do have to go uh, okay. designated uh, places. Like I, I went to my uh, local photography shop. Mm -hmm. So they were designated um, by <laughs> field print to be an official place. But there, there, there's lots of them. So you're, 
you know, you're within a couple miles of wherever you are to go get the appointment. To, you have to make an appointment and then you bring the confirmation sheet with you that you did online and then you have to physically be there. But but it isn't the ink pad, old ink pad anymore. It is a digital uh, fingerprint. Uh, it's like a, a scanner on a printer. <laughs> Yes, and Diane asks, um, Paul, did you say that you will be sending all of these, uh, the handouts with all of this yes. information tomorrow, if not today, so yes. that sites can get started? And it'll also be up on the website, too. Yes. And and I when I went to do it, it, it um, said, you know, um, list the... Uh, locations of places to go near me right and so it it will give yeah. you a choice of yeah, you'll put your um, zip code in there and it'll give you lots of choices probably depending where where you are but yeah well that's true okay anything else before we but this is and i want to reiterate that this is really important so please don't hesitate to ask questions we want to make sure this is done right and uh and we in our member file we want to make sure that um they're all cleared and uh and we're checking off all the right boxes so we you know we don't have any problems in the future Okay, should I go on to e-grants? Yes, please. Oh, and actually, one yeah. little um, uh, Diane very helpfully um, put up the the um, website for uh, the CLLS website um, that is the AmeriCorps Special Projects page. Um, but we are we are encouraging people. Uh, at the end of the slideshow today, we'll introduce you to the Literacy Works website. And that's where all of the, the upcoming documents and resources and information, we, we will, you will go to, the, to this Literacy Works AmeriCorps website from now on. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, so eGrants is the AmeriCorps National Database. And uh, we, as Literacy Works, um, access it. So that you as a supervisor do not access it, uh, but the members will, or the, or the uh, applicant will. So uh, here's enrollment in eGrants. Uh, supervisors will send members information to Literacy Works, and we will need uh, the name, the email, um, the social security um, number that Lisa was going to call, but I think we've got a we have a secure uh, part of our website that you can go and fill out a form for that. But we'll give you more information as um, as we set it up, and uh, then of course the site that they're going to be working at. Um, and so we actually enroll each member in the grant portal. And if, if the member had, and I'll talk about this in a sec, but if the member had um, enrolled in e-grants, say if you, if you had put up uh, the job description at e-grants and you were, you were um, recruiting through e-grants, the member would have done this already. They would have gone in and filled out all this information. But it, since I think most of you have not done that, the second uh, part is that we have to send them an invitation and they come in and, and fill out the information. So, but this process uh, validates their eligibility as a, a citizen uh, or resident status. And it, it, it's attesting to the criminal history checks clearance. So we have to also enter their true screen and fill print uh, results. 
into e-grants. And then again, this is Literacy Works does this. And uh, so this could take a while. So we, we, want, we want to get it started. So, um, so what happens is Literacy Works invites applicants to do their part of the enrollment in e-grants once we have their, their email. And then uh, eGrants confirms eligibility. Uh, Literacy Works entered background check completion date in eGrants. And then uh, Literacy Works final, finalizes enrollment for each member in eGrants no more than seven days after their first day of earning hours. So this is one of those things they can start working already as long as um, that we have these things, the background check, um, their citizenship eligibility. Um, so that's, they can, they can start earning their hours and we haven't actually finalized their enrollment, but we'll, hopefully that'll never happen. We'll, we'll finalize their enrollment uh, uh, before they start. Okay, so please remember an individual becomes an official AmeriCorps member on the start date recorded in eGrants. So once we put the start date in there, um, that's when they can start getting their living allowance. Okay, prior to this date, individuals should not be accruing any service hours. Okay. And I just wanted to show you what this looks like in eGrants. Again, we're going to be doing all this, but um, so for those who apply outside my AmeriCorps por portal, um, that's the eGrants portal. If you had had uh, your um, individual um, uh, job description up there and recruiting through my AmeriCorps por portal, they would have filled the information out. But so most of our uh, applicants are coming from outside. You're, you're recruiting in your communities. So um, Literacy Works, we must create and send invitations to begin enrollment in e-grants. And that's why we need the member's social security number to be able to do that. And I know this is really small to see, but these are the fields we have to fill out. So there's the first name, the middle name, the last name, the middle name isn't required. The social security um, number, uh, date of birth, and uh, email address, okay? And then the site that they're working at. So th those, that's the information Literacy Works needs from you uh, for the applicant's information so we can start this process so they, they'll get a uh, invitation to fill out the rest of it. Okay, so the sooner we get this, the sooner we can enter uh, the information into e-grants and they get the information. Okay. All right, so that's the end of eGrants. I just, I just wanted to say a few words about the payroll because it came up and most of the questions were answered, I think. But um, just wanna reiterate, this is a living allowance. It's not payroll, it's not, uh, uh, you know, they're, they're getting a living allowance. Um, and so we cover workman's comp, so it will not appear in their pay stub, okay? Um, and it won't appear in uh, their W-2 at the end of the year. And again, everything's gonna be direct deposit. So we're gonna put the direct deposit slip up on our website that will be secure. It'll be password protected and you can fill it out online. Okay, and so there, and also we'll need a W-4 from all the, all the uh, members. Okay, all right, so any, any questions? Looking in the chat.
I mean, I was that clear. I was that good. There's no questions. Wow. I'm sure there will be questions when <laughs> using it. So. Uh, that's good. Well, yeah, but we're here, again, we're here um, to answer any questions. And uh, so uh, please do not hesitate to email or, or call. Oh, dear. Let's see. Um, Diane just tried to um, access the website. Okay. Are you? Okay. You know, so, not com. It's org. It's, oh, yeah. Oh, who put com on there? I don't know. Who did that? Lisa, can you change that immediately? It is, Doc. Sorry, mistake. And um, Shanti had a question, which is good. And maybe yeah. Alice and, and Bev can answer this. So I don't know. I, I assume that the um, AmeriCorps page and the special projects area of the CLLS website will remain up, um, but that will not be um, the, the initiative specific uh, ongoing website. So the Literacy Works website will be the one, but, um, uh, oh good, and Allison just answered, yes, we can add a link um, to, from the CLLS Special Projects AmeriCorps webpage to the Literacy Works webpage. And uh, yes, I will send uh, Allison, that information. And so, but but if you want to try it, it's um, www.literacyworksamericorps.org, not .com. Yeah. And, you said it is put it in the chat, so. Oh, good. Thank you, Bev. And um, and so, yes, so we, we can actually go there now um, if you want to. We didn't know if we would have time to do that or not, but please know that it is being um, populated right now. And so it has some information right now, uh, but it will have more information as time goes by. And so that will be a really good resource for you to um, look at. I'm trying to, I'm not very good at um, multitasking. You want uh, me to bring it up or yeah, do you want to do it? Thank you. Okay, I will stop sharing for a second. So we're, the webmaster has just started working on it. Um, and so we have some resources, but all of the, um, the recordings for the virtual uh, trainings, the webinars will um, be there. The handouts will be there, the PowerPoint slides, if we have any other um, documents like the instructions for um, how to, to go through the uh, true screen and field print processes that will all be on that website. And there is no, um, you don't have to have a username or a password. It is open to everybody. So I just, I just wanna show uh, the resources page. We will... Um... We will have a lot of these documents. So, like under payroll, we already have the W 4 up there, fillable. Uh, the direct deposit form will be up there. Um, we put the AmeriCorps pledge there that everybody will recite at one point. <laughs> um, and then under training, this is where we'll put. Uh, the archive training video, the Zoom video that we're doing right now. We'll put out the handout. And um, let's see, and, and then we'll put things like the training schedule. We will have a calendar up here too of events that are coming up in our training schedule. We'll have that up soon. And then we talked about putting um, uh, like a, a listserv or something that we can all communicate together too on, on the site. And then uh, we have a page that's that's about, that's talking about, uh, that, that Bev um, talked about today about the history of, and, and what this initiative is. And there's us and there's our contact information, right there, little bios. And uh, we also have an FAQ page 
that we've gathered, you know, some of the questions that you've already asked. Uh, do I get paid? You know, what's what's that? No, it's a, it's a, it's a uh, you get a statement. Okay. Um, and and then there's AmeriCorps and National Glossary of Terms there, which is handy because we're all learning a new language. Uh, we also have uh, living allowance policies, and uh, and we'll put other things. We'll update that periodically, and then here's all our contact information. Okay, so that's the start of our website. And Paul, did you say that Marty, our webmaster, just added some confidential or secure? Oh, he's going. He's going to work on that. We haven't done it so. When you go to uh, the resource page, um, we will have um, a secure site that you'll click on for for um, secure information. And at that site, it'll be password protected. We'll give you a password. And then at that site, there'll be the, um, the direct deposit form, the W4 form, um, and anything else we, we deem as uh, confidential information. And it's, it's, it's square space um, secure is, is the, what we're using as the web app for this. And they're, they're well known for their security. So uh, it should be very secure. So let's check in with folks. We, um, we thought it would be a nice place to have a site and member supervisors be able to share information and uh, successes and questions and, and lessons learned and challenges and that sort of thing, as well as to have a separate sort of listserv for members. Is that something that would be helpful to you all? Again, you're, you are forming a community that we hope will uh, spend the next three years together if all goes well. And so would that be helpful um, in community building for you to have a, a, a place to, to communicate with each other, a special listserv? Okay, great, great, okay. Good. And we, we think that that is one way uh, to build community and a, a cohort with the members. So good, good, great. We will ask uh, Marty, our webmaster, to put that up. And is there anything else? What th This is your website. So is there anything else that you would like to see up there or um, any other functions that would be helpful to you? And you, you can always tell us later as well, but um, he's designing it now. Okay, great. Uh, when can we expect to see the information that Paul mentioned? So the information about e-grants and um, field print and true screen or Abigail, which, which precise information? And you can, you can unmute. And just just say it, Abigail, if you'd like. Um, thank you. That's so much easier. <laughs> um, <laughs> I type all day, so I know. Anyway, but yeah, the e-grant information and then um, everything you mentioned about um, everything else, because I, I have this as as you all were talking. The one person who, one of the persons that I've I've, I've uh, reached out to 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 be a full time Americorps. She was like, are you ready yet for me? And I was like, I was like, you're not gonna believe this. I'm going through this incredible like orientation right now. So mm -hmm. she's running over here tomorrow. Oh. And, <laughs> so, and I just wanna have as much as I can ready because I have been stringing her along for a little minute, you know, <laughs> so. Yeah, I, we, actually, I can address that, Paul, because at, tomorrow I'll send you, Abigail, an invitation to join the America Learns portal. And once okay. I get you joined, then I'll reach out to you and have you send me that member information. 
Oh, and then great. we'll put that number of information right into eGrants and start the whole process. They'll get an invitation asking them to sign on to eGrants and fill out the rest of their eGrants uh, application or, uh, okay. uh, you know, become a user and get a password and all that kind of stuff. And right. then we'll get their social security number. And once that right. starts, we can start this whole process of giving you instructions on how to coach them through TrueScreen and um, through the right. fingerprinting. That's good. She told me to tell you not to worry. She hasn't murdered anyone. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay. good. I can't tell you how happy this discussion makes me because for months, California Volunteers has said, submit a completed member file. And we say, but we don't have any members. We can't do right, that. Right. So Abigail, thank you so much. Sure. We and we said, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, okay, I'll look forward to talking to you. This is great. Man, Lisa, you're going to be busy. Diane's got one. Carrie's got yes. two. I think the next week is going to be super, super fun for me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I know it's been a little hurry up and wait, uh, but <laughs> it, it's just a lot of, of uh, different pieces in play that we're trying to to fit together into the puzzle. So, oh, look, everybody has members coming on board. This is very, very exciting. So, oh, so great. Great. the other answer, the, and we'll try to get the secure side up. Um, I'd like to say tomorrow, but uh, by by the end of the weekend. Excellent. Excellent. With all, the, all those forms and everything. Again, so, this is not to make the people who are not quite that far along in the process um, feel bad. We understand everybody is um, at, at different stages of the process. Some of you, we have been amazed and delighted that you you just send back the MOU and site agreement, no questions, no, no um, requested changes. And then we absolutely understand that other people, and I have worked for them a lot. So I completely understand um, some cities and counties and library jur jurisdictions are much um, more complex and they have much more um, stringent and rigid requirements. And we understand it's it's not you. And you, oh, people keep apologizing and saying, I'm sorry, we don't mean to be a pain. It's like, no, you're not, you're not being a pain. We, we understand that it's just different governing bodies have different processes and some are more, um, streamlined and easy to get through than others. And so we want to do what we can um, to work with you to, to make that happen. And we absolutely understand this is going to be a different, different timeline for everybody. So that's totally, totally fine. Um, Regina asks, so there is no AmeriCorps member application, true or false, there is actually um, a, an AmeriCorps member application. And I believe, Beth, that it's already up on the CLLS. That's a great, it's a trick question. There is no standard AmeriCorps application. You may develop your own AmeriCorps application, Regina, and there is a template up on libraryliteracy.org under projects. Adapt it, put your logo on it, put the questions on that you want, but we are not using a standardized AmeriCorps application. California volunteers did not make that available to us. So please make sure your members apply and that you ask the questions you need to ask and that you want to ask. So that's flexible. Many people have adapted that application, but yes, they have to fill out an application, but there is not uh, the must application. So I actually, in the spirit of Dr. No, <laughs> learn something on this call and it was an assumption I, I it was in some document that I read but it was a sample document from another program it appears and we will wait for final confirmation it appears that your members do not have to go through CPR training if you want to send them through CPR training that's great if your city offers it and they're willing to take them that's great but I don't believe it's a requirement anymore I think it used to be a requirement Wow. First aid. It was first aid and CPR. We did that back in 2004, I know. Yeah, no, I recall that. Yeah. Um, so I'm not taking it off the list, but I don't think that it's mandated by the federal government. Um, I think if you were out there chopping trees or fighting fires, it probably would be, so, or working in a healthcare setting. We'll find out for you. Um, oh, yeah. Well, I, I think we did find out, right? But we have to decide internally, Kathy, whether we want internally. I understand. Sorry about that. <laughs> behind the curtain. You guys have just seen. So, 
Okay. So um, let's see. I think Abigail or no, Regina asked if we could put the link, the link to that um, customizable member application. Yeah, uh, we got it for you. I did that. I hope I did it correctly. Um, and then Diane, so the process for new members is one, application. Two, background check process. Three, October training. Anything else? Um, yeah, I, I would add the e-grant in there. So we need their we need their social security number and uh, and uh, email and first and last name, and so we can we can start the process. So we can put them in e grants, and then they get an invitation, an email invitation to fill out the rest of the information. So, so it's more like I was going to say application, interview, selection, background check, e grant. Um, data entry, then training. <laughs> there yeah, would I, would, be I would say e grants and fingerprints maybe at the same time because the oh, e grant point. takes a, lot, a while. Sure. And and we need the fingerprints. Um, we need the two screen and fill print to to put into e grants. So mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Yeah, and um, uh. Oh, did I just totally lose my train of thought? Uh, it was, oh, right. So there are some required uh, documents that you will need to, you will need to sign uh, as the supervisor and your member will need to sign. And so in part two of this orientation next Thursday, um, and, and we're gonna share with you what we plan to do next week, um, we will be covering all of those documents so that you know, and we'll be sending out a list and, and copies of all of those docu documents so that you have them in place. So there's like the member orientation checklist and the member uh, service agreement. There are a lot of different bits and pieces. So we want, just want to make sure that everybody has the full complement of all of the documents that you need. Diane. Like Diane, yeah, Diane, okay. Yeah, my brain is spinning again right now. So, um, Paul, in your email, yes. can you outline, like for the background checks, give us actual links for the e-grant. Do we give you the information or? Yes, you okay. give me the information. I enter it, so you don't have to go into e-grants. Okay. That's, that's one one headache you won't have in this. <laughs> okay, and so if you could just outline everything Kathy just said, because I couldn't write it fast enough. Um, all the documents that they're going to need to sign. We're not meeting till Thursday next week, but the training is the following week, and we have to have the fingerprints done with time. So the prints need to be done next week. So if we had the documents that people needed to be to sign, this week, I could have them ready for next week. I mean, I, I'm just feeling the stress of the time is what I'm feeling. And, and we are too. And so we totally sympathize. And so we, um, you know, we have not had a lot of time to get this initiative going. And so I, I sometimes feel like we are one step ahead of you. Um, and so we do thank you for your patient. Um, yeah, we, we will try to do that, Diane. Um, okay, so we'll, we'll try to get you um, as, thank you, Bev, for, for putting in, oh no, it was actually Sabrina. Thank you, Sabrina, for, for putting in, um, yeah, member agreement, position description, member commitment. So we will sort through all of those documents that you need your members to sign and review and be aware of. Um, we will try our very best to get those out to you tomorrow. And could I just again reiterate one point? They're, they are applicants until Sorry. they get uh, adjudicated through True Screen and and uh, uh, Fillprint and get into e grants. They they have a listing in e grants, a file in e grants that um, shows that they're citizens or, you know, that, that through their social security number. So they're still applicants until they've passed all that. And then Literacy Works says, okay, they're, they're ready to go. They're ready to be a member. And, yeah. then, and then, then you can sign all those documents. And Shay, I, 
I think you've been sent a number of them. Honestly, I will have to go back to look. I am not quite sure that we've sent you the member commitment. Shay, do you remember getting the member commitment document? I, I'll, I'll have to go back and check. There are just a lot of bits and pieces. So. There are a lot of documents. It may actually be within the member service agreement document, Kathy. So um, I don't think I think that I think that it's, um, but I I could be wrong because I get them mixed up because there are so many of them. Um, I do know somebody had a question and it was a very um, helpful one that um, that I sent you the official member position description and the official member service agreement, and in the member service agreement there is a black a blank page for where the official position description should go. And I was not sure when I sent them out whether those needed to be returned as two separate signed documents, or if we were supposed to embed, sort of combine the position description within the member service agreement. So unfortunately, after the fact, I got, um, uh, I, I asked uh, Aram and she said that you do need to combine both of the, um, you need to insert the signed um, official member position description into the official member service agreement so that that is one document with signatures that you will submit um, in a combined form. Can we get them the member service agreement? The clean copy is on the website, but I don't know. I, I've sent, uh, yes. Okay. So, Kathy, I realized you sent it out. It was just. Oh, yeah. yeah, I can do that. Sorry. And I'm sorry about that. No, it's, it's quite all right. And as long as it's up on the new portal, um, Literacy Works AmeriCorps portal, that's great too. Oh, she is ahead of the game. She thinks somebody already signed the uh, member commitment. Fantastic. So, uh, okay. And let's see. Will that email include an overview of steps order? with note of required docs and deadlines. Cassandra has been waiting for this for mm, six weeks. Cassandra, I think you have been very patient. So um, we, can put <laughs> we can put those steps together. I was hoping that today's training might actually, you know, give you a little bit of an idea of, of what those steps are, but um, Lisa is the best at doing this. And so, um, Lisa and I can work together to make sure that, that we put that together for you. Thank you. Uh, let's see, Carrie, then their awards will be reduced. That has, yeah, that is a stress. That, that is for sure. And, and I have to admit that I was not clear uh, on understanding that the living allowance um, actually started on the, the member start date. And so you, you do, they do lose out on some of their uh, living allowance. So, so that is a good reason for getting folks on board as quickly as possible. What other questions? These are good questions, thank you. Um, okay. Uh, Carrie says, all the paperwork has to go through our attorney and our contract person. Yeah, yeah, it's, um, some people have very, very um, complicated processes. So we understand that. Um, okay. All right. So um, Lisa, do you feel ready and prepared to maybe give people a little bit of a preview about what we'll be doing um, in next week's part two orientation? Yes, I do. Um, we will have a complete calendar fleshed out of all deadline dates, important dates, things you need to know. I understand that we'll also get a preliminary uh, list of important dates and deadlines out to you tomorrow in our email um, that to follow up with this meeting. But the um, our definitely by next Thursday, we'll also have a format online that you can reference and go to um, of our calendar. Uh, let's see here. Um, so while you're looking at that, Lisa, so we, we, um, 
wanted to give you the most fundamental information as quickly as we could up front. And so there will be other pieces of information, other uh, trainings that we'll need um, to ask you to participate in. But for these first two trainings, we are just trying to get you the most essential information that you need to get you going through this very complex federal, state, local process. We do have an official member file checklist, which we'll send to you tomorrow also, which uh, lists all the documents and files that are needed uh, from now to the end of the year agreement with the member. So you can kind of understand what um, is on that list. Um, next week, we're going to go over in detail the member service agreement because uh, we need to touch on member supervision expectations, disciplinary procedures, policies, and program design. Um, those are some things that we'll touch on. We'll also go over in detail over the, the literacy works and library site agreement, which also talks about policies and procedures and any uh, disciplinary procedures that have to go on. Um, we'll talk more in detail about all the required paperwork, including the acknowledgement of understanding. And then I'll present again on uh, reports and surveys and assessments that you will be doing in America Learns and when those are due on regular basis or once during the, the life of this grant for that member. So um, that will be the, the America Learns platform will be fleshed out a little bit more too in that training. And that's what I have on the list for so far. Is there anything else that anybody like needs right now? or that you want to have included next week? Nancy, I noticed, uh, Nancy from YOLO, I noticed, noted your question about a, a better description on tax withholding. And we'll work on getting that to you uh, as well. And I don't feel so confident that I could explain it verbally, um, not being a tax expert, but we did note that question. Diane, is there a hand up? I'm sitting here with printouts of the template for the position description, the AmeriCorps member application, and the member service agreement. So the member application, I think you said that this is just a template and we can edit it, but I'm not sure what information on here is necessary and what information on here is optional. So I'd hate to remove something that needs to be here. Yeah, Diane, this is a question we asked the California volunteers at the on the outset, because I do remember there was an official application the last time we did this, and they said very clearly there is no longer an official application. So let me answer two ways. There is a listing on the national portal, uh, and that has required questions, including a lot of questions you probably don't need the information for, and also ask people for their social security number and other stuff like that. It's a secure portal. I was reluctant to ask people to collect online or paper applications with people's social security number unless you had a secure way of dealing with that. I know that literacy programs are not HR departments. This is not stuff you wanna have sitting in your email or in your file drawers, and you don't want to have applicants sending you this stuff in email. However, there are things that we do need to know once we enroll the member. Obviously we need their social security numbers in order to complete the citizenship check. We're gonna need, Paul will need a W-4 and some other information. But the questions are really up to you. Once we get people enrolled in e-grants, they do, they, you know, they'll have to provide a mailing address. They'll have to provide an email address. There's a whole bunch of stuff they have to provide. But uh, California volunteers did not give us a standard application. And there were reasons why we did not take the questions directly from the online portal. I transferred those over to a document I used some of those questions to develop the template, but I explicitly left some of those questions out because a paper application or an online form, a fillable PDF is not a, a document that seemed to me to meet uh, a standard of security that you should have for people's private information. Um, so that's my answer to your question. Uh, we don't have to file, um, a standard application in the member in the member um, file. Um, is that right, Lisa? We just need to have the information that, that's requested uh, in eGrants. 
there may be a application you have to submit, but there's not the one application you have to submit. Yeah, so th this is a good thing for us to get absolute confirmation on because it's a little confusing. And so I, I would like to say that, that um, Bev and Allison did a great job of posting um, drafts and templates of the documents on the California Library Literacy Special Projects AmeriCorps webpage to get you going and to also sort of give you an idea of what you would need to be dealing with. And um, those though are not the final forms. So if, uh, if you are submitting required signed official forms, please use the ones that I have sent you and that will be on the Literacy Works website because those are the final forms. So we got um, guidance from California volunteers, uh, AmeriCorps that is, seems a little funny, but so for the position description, you can have your own position description, right? Because you may, want specific things like Paul pointed out, you may want this position to be bilingual uh, preference or required. So you can make your own position description. However, that is not the approved official position description that we need to file with California Volunteers AmeriCorps. There is only one form so it's a little bit of dissonance here, right? Because you're you're customizing one form for your own purposes, but that is not the form that you are then submitting to California Volunteers. California Volunteers AmeriCorps needs uniformity in those documents. So we can certainly you know send those out again to make sure that everybody is working off the the most current, up to date. Um, approved forms. Um, but if if there's any question, please use the ones that I have sent you that have said this is the official form versus ones that say like template and, and draft. Yeah, Carrie, it's a very good idea. We'll send it again. Um, we're hearing that loud and clear from, from, from you guys. Um, and certainly, uh, we appreciate, you know, you were working with working documents for a long time. Uh, and that's because we knew we had a very tight timeline and we needed to get you started. Um, it was certainly in the case of the application, the online application, there were some questions that, uh, you know, the criminal background information, probably not stuff you want sitting in your office in an unsecure file drawer um, or in your email. So. Yeah, there, there are different versions for sure, Carrie. So yeah, we, we want to make sure that everybody has the correct version because we don't want you know any time to be wasted on, on doing that. And um, Sabrina has a question. Um, am I correct that we can send Lisa our potential member information before or while we work on getting background checks? If so, what information does Lisa need to start e-grants process? Yeah, so what I'll do is tomorrow I'll send an email invitation to everyone um, who applied from their library, asking them to join the America Learns portal. Once you've set up your profile there and signed in, then I will email you um, for the list of your members who are applying. I'll ask you certain specific demographic information that I need to have in order to get them enrolled in eGrants. And then the minute we get that information on those members and I obtain their social security number, then I'll get them straight enrolled into eGrants. And then we start the whole background check process. Oh, and, they, and the members also will be invited to fill out their portion of the e-grants application that they need to. And so that email is forthcoming tomorrow. So we, please know, we understand this is, this is complicated, right? It's complicated and there are a lot of working pieces. And so please do not hesitate to ask something again and again right? So we, we would be very happy to answer your questions. We, we know it's just flying at you. So, okay. What else? Oh, we do, I think, have one more slide, Paul. Uh, do you want to, let's see, I can turn my screen, I guess. Let me oh, just... you want to do it? Okay. Uh, it's a, 
uh, yeah. We just wanted you to know that just to throw even more resources at you. <clears throat> but there's some really good information on it. Uh, just a sec. So there is the Literacy Works website that is um, that we're populating right now. Oh, sorry. Um, but also um, there is this AmeriCorps uh, website and on the California Volunteers website. And I, there are just a lot of cooks in this kitchen, right? And so I know CV is California Volunteers. They are part of the governor's office charged with, um, charged with, uh, you know, volunteerism in California, and they are the ones who are administering the federal AmeriCorps program in California, and they've been working with the California State Library, and just so many, so many players in this. But the California Volunteers AmeriCorps website has some really nice resources for you. So you can see um, there's a, a whole section on member recruitment, um, member onboarding, criminal history checks, member management, benefits, training. Now, please do remember that the California Volunteers AmeriCorps um, programs cover just a plethora of, of different social and human services, right? So these are not literacy specific, they're not library specific, but there's still some really nice um, uh, resources and information here. So we did want you to be aware of it. And also be aware that because of the nature of our initiative where Literacy Works is taking on the bulk of this management aspect, that a lot of these resources are telling you to do this. And you, as you're reading it, it reads as if you, the supervisor, are supposed to do all of these things. But Literacy Works is also handling a lot of this and taking it on. So like we discussed today, there's many roles that we are playing and many roles that we're asking you to play. So I didn't want anyone to be confused by reading the criminal histories check resource page and thinking that they're supposed to do all of those things in there because we are taking that on. And if you have any questions, you can just reach out to us about whether you're supposed to be doing something or whether we're handling it. Good point, Lisa. Thank yeah, you. Lisa, that's a great caveat. And remember, it's not the Carlsbad City, you know, AmeriCorps program or whatever your city or county is, uh, nor is it the state of California. The grant owner, a grantee is actually Pacific Library Partnership, and we are so grateful um, to them for being willing to take on this very massive, complex undertaking, and for Literacy Works for being willing to uh, be the partner that makes all the pieces work. And that's really a great thing. Um, it all stems back to you guys and CLLS and the desire to see AmeriCorps members back in library literacy programs. Some of you have that living memory and lived experience of working with AmeriCorps members before. Some of you have been AmeriCorps members uh, and some of you have told us how much you need help building capacity and recovering from the pandemic in your programs. So it's great team effort. We really wanna thank PLP, which isn't represented on this call, but is behind everything, uh, the financial wizardry, the practicality and making it do, making it happen, the spirit of literacy works, the contracted partner, uh, and of course the state library. So Allison and I wanna thank you for that. Thank you. So we're, we're at um, almost 2.30, but, and we can certainly leave, um, end early, but um, now is a good time if you have questions. Um, oh, is that somebody, Diane, is that? Diane's got her hand up. And I was gonna say, if anyone wants to go more slowly through the prohibited and unallowable activities, we could do that, but I don't think you want to. Rapid fire. You'll hear it again. Diane, go ahead. Diane. I got this one, which is the um, application. Uh -huh. My understanding is I can edit this however I want. I use this to get people to tell me they want the position. I go through it and I don't need to give that to you. Then I have this position description that you sent. This one is essential. They sign it, it's ready and it gets it included in their in their member service agreement. Then That's I got this 
big ugly thing called the member <laughs> service agreement. <laughs> what, 23, 27 pages, something? Yeah, with lots of legal mumbo jumbo, you guys. But there's a spot in here where it looks like this one goes. That's right. These go together. This one, I can do whatever I want with. You don't need it. And then when they when we choose them, they go through e-grants and they give all this kind of information to Lisa. Is that true or do you ever need this? Um, I was gonna say, we don't need it to file in the member file, but Diane, I would suggest that you keep any paperwork for three years. That is, you know, for legally, we have to keep it for a minimum of three years, but just for your own sake and benefit, uh, especially if you wanna go back to a previous applicant, uh, you might wanna keep that on file. Right, I'll keep this. Yes, that the, one, the one that you can do with what you want. Yeah. What I want. Okay, so that I can change however I want, but these two. And then no, we'll change. get the link to the background check. It looks like you fill all that out online. So this is the only thing that you need me to have them fill out, right? Then there is a member commitment, as I think Sabrina uh, oh, I don't have that. Okay. pointed out. So I don't know if you have that yet, On it, to be honest with you. I, I don't think I've said it out yet. I just can't remember. I'll, I will check. Okay. Well, there's lots of commitment um, legal stuff in here. So maybe it's in this. Yeah, you would think that that would cover it, but evidently not. Evidently, there is a separate form that is a member commitment. All right. So these two for now, and then I'll, I'll get the fingerprints done next week if we can possibly make an appointment, right? Thank and the you. member can go online and do all this stuff and then make the appointment at the place to be Closer scanned. To her. Yeah, okay. And again, right. to, to Paul's point, it's the applicant, right? Who, That's correct. You can yeah. do that. Um, we don't. We just don't want to set up any expectations if, if anybody runs into a snag. So. Okay, all right. Well, it makes it easy. There's just the two docs. So far, <laughs> I, I will send you the member commitment. Good, yeah. So three. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Carrie. Hi there. Uh, I want to be positive about getting all this through, but I just need to kind of plan ahead for the scenario. I did, we have a complex process here, which I hope none of the rest of you have, where all of this has to go through the attorney, as I mentioned, and our contract person. Because I had the all of the site uh, paperwork, like the site agreement and the site, I think there were two, site yeah. supervisor. Um, and I mentioned to you, uh, Kathy, we had emailed, I was able to get those through with the one change about the payment. So I'll have to make that change. However, since I don't have all the member things, I will when you have, send out the member commitment. Uh, based on the amount of time that it took to get the site paperwork through, I'm a little concerned that there's it, it, the possibility of getting through in a week is, is small. Um, so I have two members, a potential member, excuse me, applicants in the wings. What if we can't get this through before the training? I'm a little concerned about it. I know they'll have it okay. reduced. Can I oh, can I say yeah. something? Please. Yeah, I, if you could, and and I'll we'll we'll send you the field print and the true screen information, so you could have them start doing that. And if you can get us their social security number, we'll put them in the e grants tomorrow. Okay, so they okay. could they could start this week, and and a lot of these fingerprint places are open on the weekends. So um, they could, if you have two people in the wings waiting, you know, that maybe we can jumpstart it a little bit for you by okay. getting them started tomorrow to get, to get okay. that information, the applicants. So Carrie, okay. just to clarify, you, your city attorney and council need to sign off on the member agreement not the council but the uh it's just our attorney and our contracts people they need to sign off on the member they agreement. need to review everything yes <laughs> at least that's what they're telling me <laughs> i'll 
uh, once I have it, I can send it to them and say, well, this is the member, yeah. you know, need to be yeah, any agreement we enter into, we have to get cleared. I'm, okay. I'm a little unclear about why the member agreement, but like I said, without being able to show them the whole package, I, I think I won't get a final answer. Okay. And do, do they need to see signed copies of those no. documents? Just, no. just, the, just the documents? Just, just all the right now. So I know I keep poking out which is the right version and do we have all of them? Is once I have all the right ones, I can send it to them and then they go, oh, well, okay, I get this now. Because none of the folks who did AmeriCorps before back in the day, you know, when I was here, uh, are here anymore. Yes. So I, kind of busted out their old, you know, uh, some of the old paperwork. And that did help grease the skids a little bit with uh, the the the, uh, the side agreements that you sent me. Because um, I had copies from like 2008, like 2006, 7, 8. Mm -hmm. So I could kind of show them, hey, see how this just kind of went through. <laughs> Those were the days, right? I know, I know. And I see a couple of people are in the same boat too. So 